uh, advocate uh, Samin and the members uh, of staff of, of parliament, um, our stakeholders, uh, the guests and the media. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, this morning, um, we will be focusing on engaging the responses of uh, the CSLO as well as uh, the DTIC uh, on the negotiating mandates. Uh, from the we, we were hoping to have done that uh, last week, uh, but due to uh, term constraints, uh, we decided uh, to amend uh, our legislative program. Um, at this stage, uh, we'll ask uh, Ms. Solomon to indicate uh, if there are any apologies. Um, Chair, at the moment, we just have um, a standing apology from Mr. Lanzmann, um, but no further apologies beyond that. But in attendance today, we have got um, yourself, Honorable Dango, Honorable Mamrahani, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Brautuset, and Honorable Lant. And from the staff side, we've got my co-committee secretary, Mr. Nizulu, our content advisor, Mr. Sishuba, um, our researcher, Mr. Neshi, um, our commercial committee assistant, Mr. Bazir. Um, we've also got um, advocate um, Fandamarva as well as um, advocate Ali in attendance today. Too. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of uh, apologies, I would also like to tender an uh, apology for myself. I have an appointment uh, with the doctor uh, uh, for a checkup, I have to log out at uh, 11. Uh, we turn over to Honorable uh, uh, Moimang uh, to, to take over. Um, can we then, uh, Honorable Members, uh, start with the engagement uh, on the inputs that were made in terms of uh, responses to the negotiating mandates. Any questions for clarities? Today, the focus is on the questions for clarities and comments, uh, but uh, then I will ask uh, later, uh, uh, Ms. Madia to- Recording in progress. I will ask Ms. Madia to flight the legislative uh, program, uh, but, uh, before that, I want to indicate that, that uh, in terms of uh, the legislative program, we want to make a request to members uh, that uh, though we have already put it in the draft uh, legislative uh, program, that uh, be because we, had, we were hoping that uh, today we will be uh, voting on the negotiating mandates as well as the uh, next week would be considering the e-list, uh, but because we have not yet engaged the responses, we have uh, had to amend the program. But we want to make a request that uh, we, we have a day uh, during the constituents period just to consider uh, the e-list, which we was uh, originally scheduled to be considered on the 20th of June. Uh, instead, we consider it sometime uh, there's a proposed date uh, in, in July after we are back from the from the trip, um, so we, we want to to request that. Uh, but after the engagement, it will be uh, flighted. Honourable uh, Lonta, see your hand is up. I do have quite a few comments. Um, unfortunately. I have just concluded with my second meeting in the city and all my notes I've left. So I can take a first bite at the cherry um, and then as the responses come back, I will then just quickly have to drive where the rest of my notes are, do the rest of the members and then take a second bite. If you would do a lot too, um, when we engage, please, thanks. Okay. Perhaps uh, maybe in the meantime, let, let, let's uh, go through the the legislative program and uh, see if we, we, we are fine with it. Um, Honorable Dango, before that. Yeah, Chairperson, um, I, I think we don't have final mandates yet. So we just need to urge provinces to send their final mandates in as soon as possible. 
so that we can consider them. At the moment, we've got uh, an expression of support or non-support, but we don't have final mandates yet. No, uh, they, they, can't, they can't have final mandates until yeah. we, we send them our responses. Uh, our responses to their final mandates. So yeah. we, we must first have a response. That's why on the 13th and the 20th, and also the, the date, if it's going to be agreed, uh, we will then have a product that will send to, to the provinces so that then the provinces can uh, uh, develop their final mandates. So for yeah. now, yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah, but so today, we, today we are engaging on the responses of the department and the CSLO uh, against the, uh, the not necessarily against, uh, in, rela in, in, in response to the negotiating mandates uh, from the provinces. Yeah. Person, so for now, let, let, can we for now uh, focus on the flighted uh, uh, program, the legislative program? Uh, today, the six, it's a continuation of uh, responses on the negotiating of uh, performance. So well, it's basically the engagement, but then the, we will get responses on the engagement that uh, uh, we'll be making as members, uh, both uh, uh, members of the select committee as well as uh, our provinces. Um, and then ne next week on the 13th, it's a voting on the negotiating uh, mandates. Uh, of the two bills uh, that will continue again on the 20th. We're proposing that uh, in July 25th, it, 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 that will be during the constituency uh, period to making a request that members make themselves available uh, uh, to, so that we can uh, consider uh, the tabling of the e-list. Uh, after that, we will then send uh, the product uh, to the provinces we expect then that uh, between the 25th and say the, the 4th uh, of uh, September uh, provinces would have sent uh, their uh, final mandates uh, which will then be considered uh, on the on the 6th of September by this committee uh, Especially the, the issue of the 25th, uh, I would like to hear members if uh, they will make themselves available. Can we have comments on that? Chairperson, I would make myself available. Okay. And... Uh, Chairperson, good morning. Um, I, will be I will be available, Comrade Chairperson. Thank you. Okay. Morning, Chairperson, and yeah. morning, honorable members. It's about them to last two laps and twenty Vela. Okay. Chairperson, um, it's a long time away. I don't have anything in the diary at the moment, but I'll die yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I belong to. Good morning, Chair. It's yes. boss of speaking. I can also make myself available, but it is far in advance, and I don't know what the constituency program is at this stage. Oh. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. But uh, I'll make myself available. Thank you so much. I think uh, Noble Lont is... Uh, Chair, um, just a correction, Chair. Um, you mentioned that the, the final mandate is on the 6th of September. It's actually on the 5th of September. Oh, sorry, sorry. Today is the six. So maybe I'm confusing it uh, with today's uh, date. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so in principle, we agree uh, to meet on the 25th of uh, July. Um, in principle, I will put it that way. Okay. Then can we then continue if there are any comments and questions uh, for clarities? Uh, on the responses uh, by the department as well as by the CSLO of Parliament.
I don't know, maybe what, what uh, I must uh, suggest uh, uh, to facilitate the process, if uh, we can just flight uh, the CLSO's uh, responses first, and we just run down uh, and see whether members have questions uh, for clarities on those. Just, just to refresh uh, the minds of uh, members. Person, good morning to you and to the members. I'm getting my presentation ready. Um, yeah. If I can just get um, sharing rights. So I'm just quickly um, reminding the host to give me sharing rights. Okay. Ms. Solomons? I, I will do so. Just give me one second, Chair. I will do so in a moment. Sure, I think that that um, you should now be able to see my screen. Um, can I just confirm, would you like me just to do a quick uh, go through so that members can can remember all the matters or yes, do you please. want me to go slide, go through everything? OK, so there were first just some general comments relating to drafting, uh, public participation, uh, indigenous law and how that affects copyright and generally on the constitutionality and that we cannot oust Section 36. And then it went in respect of clause by clause, uh, speaking to accessible format copy. Of course, this is the, the blind SA um, uh, affected definition, uh, authorized entity is the same. Also in respect of performer, which also then cross over to the performance protection amendment bill. Also spoke to technological protection measure and uh, circumvention devices, those definitions. Um, and then generally about local organizations and the fact that they will be prescribed, so there will not be any confusion about who they are. Section um, 8A, which deals with remuneration and how that will work, the fact that we need collecting societies. 9A, regarding sound recordings, and here the question was about offenses. And um, I explained that th that will be clear because we will we'll work from a charge sheet and the court will give a judgment. Then also I focused a bit on constitutionality and treaties. And the first two were just the fact that um, some, some uh, provinces expressed a concern. And then on the next slide, some provinces um, also stressed the fact that there's a need for balance between the rights in the constitution. Um, when we look at the bill, we need to balance the rights of, of the all the parties that are involved. Um, I spoke about arbitrary deprivation, what that is how the exceptions um, con conform with global movements, global um, uh, the direction rather that WIPO um, is going. I spoke about specifically what arbitrary deprivation is and spoke about this, the, the, the relationships that have to be considered. And then I unpacked that. And um, in the end, my um, finding was that the um, Gee, I'm sorry. I've got. I see. I've got the wrong. I've got the. I'm very. I do apologize. I've. Um. I'm talking to you about the submissions. But it was very similar to what we have here. But if you will give me a moment, because otherwise I'm going to talk about things that that came from submissions and not from the mandate. I oh, sincerely no. apologize. Now, let me just get the correct presentation out. Um, okay. I'll quickly skip over those slides that I've done because, um, more or less, uh, I mean the submissions that that this um committee received were very similar to that that the provinces received. So yeah. um, a lot of the inputs were in fact the same, um, but not a hundred percent. Let me just go there. Um, um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I was giving you the right presentation. I just called it um, submissions, which is very, very strange. But anyway, um, I now confused myself and I, I do apologize. 
Let me just no quickly problem. do this. <laughs> Reading view. There we go. Sure. Okay. So I do, I sincerely apologize. That was now, I thought it was the right presentation. And then I saw the heading and I thought, oh my word, that I now um, opened the totally wrong presentation. Okay. So then um, section um, 8A, as I said, yeah. indicating about collecting yeah. facilities. Yeah. Okay, just a, a, a minute, uh, uh, Advocate for uh, uh, an April, no, my mom? No, that was just uh, expressing my apology that I started at uh, Africa House and I thought yeah. that the thing had turned. Okay, no, no we, 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 we raised that as well, that uh, because you always attend the meeting on Tuesday, uh, so maybe you are held up there. So apologies accepted, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, uh, advocate, you can continue. Thank you, Chairperson. So, that's section accepted, yeah, okay. Honorable, uh, my mom, I had uh, requested to be excused at 11, so you'll uh, take over from 11, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Okay, uh, advocate. Thank you, Chairperson. So as I was saying before, I confused myself um, in Section 9A. Uh, there I just spoke about the fact that the, the uh, offences that we will be looking at is something that will be clear to a court because there will be a charge sheet and there will be findings specifically in respect of dates. They're not constitutionality in treaties. As I said, there was this need for balance. I spoke about arbitrary deprivation. I spoke about um, the fact that it aligns with global movements and that we look at the relationships. So the next slides, like I said, was simply to show each of these um, exceptions were um, limited. It is not, the, the relationship is clear. And um, in my submission, there is sufficient reason when considering all the factors. Um, when we look at all the relationships, the bill do comply with what is required by the constitution. And of course, lastly, there is procedural fairness. I also quickly touched on trade, occupation, and profession, although this did not come out clearly in the mandates, but it does speak to constitutionality. And I also here just indicated that although um, there is a right to choose your trade, occupation, and profession, the constitution also allows the, the government to regulate. Um, such. Um, I also spoke about the three-step test, which specifically speaks to uh, treaty compliance. I pointed out that the, the, the view even of WIPO is that the treaties are not necessarily to be incorporated word for word. They accept that countries need to take their own history, their own social situation into a, a account. And for us, Definitely, we will have to take our constitution into account and they allow countries to determine the scope of what they do. And then if we go further specifically into the three-step test, um, there is a view that you can't just take the step, the, the, the test one by one. You need to look at it as a whole. Um, and then, of course, my, I submitted that the exceptions do, in fact, comply with these three steps. And so does the general principle of fair use. Um, I also expressed that, that it's not something that we include because you, if you, the moment if you put the, the, the three step, the three steps of the three step test into the bill, it actually nullifies the exception that you have there because you will then have a layering of uh, limitations on the exception. Whereas the idea is for the exception and its own limits, um, what it is for. Uh, the specific instances that each exception deal with in as a whole to comply with the three-step test as a whole. Um, then I also spoke to section 12a and that we can't delete it um, because what section 12a does is it is replacing the current section 12 which deals with fair dealing and what uh, section 12a then does is it introduces the principle of fair use and how fair use has been used by the department as a tool to create a balance that the Copyright Act at the moment does actually not give. There is an imbalance between a copyright owner who is not an author, the author themselves, and the users. And that is what these bills are trying to do. They are trying to balance that right 
as well as to make provision for uh, digital use, which will become a future, um, so in other words, to future proof the act for digital development. Um, then I also just mentioned that there are other countries who have hybrid um, um, application of fair use and that we cannot really fairly say that fair use will create legal uncertainty. Fair dealing also appeared in courts. There have been many cases that, that had to, where the court had to look at fair dealing. But also with fair use, we have countries that have been using it for very long. And I even mentioned that in the USA, there's a whole database that you can type in your situation and, and it will come up and you will see what, what courts in that country have decided. And because our courts will be guided and have, have found that they are allowed to look at international law when they apply law, it is likely that they will consider the USA judgments and, um, of course, subject to our own constitution, will apply similar principles. Um, in respect of, uh, there was a specific proposal from Pumalanga to um, indicate that when we look at fair use, there must be uh, permission sought from authors. And I explained that 12a is actually the clause that where you don't have to seek permission. And the rationale behind that is that your use must be fair. It must be, you cannot use the whole work. It has to be something that is fair. And that is why you don't have to ask permission. So if I want to use a quote from someone in my assignment, I don't have to write to America to get the permission of the author. I can simply quote from their work and just give them the due um, right of, of their name and so on. Um, then also in respect of um, specific exceptions in 12b, um, I also pointed out when we look at um, the issue of uh, personal copies, uh, again, the issue that these exceptions are specific cases, these specific limits, it is not something that you can go um, over and beyond. You, you can't copy a whole, a whole work. It will have to be something that is fair practice. Um, and, um, and, and fair practice will include issues of non-normal exploitation, not unreasonably prejudicing legitimate interests and so on. Um, there was also a proposal to add the words acquired lawfully to the, the exception relating to personal copies. Um, what I advised the committee was that we, in fact, did try this wording in a previous committee. Uh, the public's response was uh, quite outspoken, indicating that if we add the words acquired lawfully, this will affect certain sectors, especially such as libraries. Um, and um, my proposal in the end was that should the committee find that they, they want some aspect of lawfulness in the text of the bill, um, I would recommend that we rather use lawfully accessed and not define it so that you at least give uh, a court uh, uh, enough scope to look at the facts of each case before them and not be limited by words in an act. Um, in respect of educational and academic activities, I just ma made it clear that uh, the bill does not allow plagiarism. Moral rights are protected throughout. Um, in respect of libraries, archives, museums, and galleries, um, I also here indicated that uh, there are limitations. The, the use is limited to activities of libraries, archives, museums, and galleries. Access is something that we look at in the interlibrary loan system. It is something that happens all over the world. It means that a, a library can lend a work to another library. And of course, that must come back to, to the first library. So all that that 19C actually does is just to allow these um, entities, libraries, archives, museums, and galleries to operate, especially with the type of um, actions that are possible now in the digital age. Um, persons with a disability, uh, here I think most provinces, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, most provinces supported the inclusion of, of the, the, the court's wording and blind SA. And what I simply explained is that because the court and the Marrakesh Treaty both limited um, themselves to visual and, and print disabilities, that does not mean that our bill can be limited to that because we need to look at our constitution and the right to equality, freedom of expression, education, human dignity and cultural life. 
which are rights of all persons without a disability as well as persons with any type of disability. We cannot just focus on print simply because the court and because the treaty focuses on, on, on prints and visual disabilities. We need to provide for all types of disability. And then also in respect of all works, um, I just gave the example of, you know, what would sheet music be? Would it be literary as the court of, um, limited its judgment to, or could it be musical works or sound recordings? And because things like that aren't clear, um, my recommendation is that Section 19D should include all forms of disability and all works. And then I just provided some proposed wording. Um, clause 24, the commissioned work. I just pointed out here that the, the concern regarding the tribunal's powers in this, in this section was not something to interfere between the, the contract of, of parties. Um, where, where the tribunal ro the tribunal's role comes in is where commissioned work that is not of a personal nature is not used by the person who commissioned it. And of course, both parties will have the opportunity to state their case. And I explained that this, uh, this specific um, power given to the tribunal came from a, a situation where, especially with the, the SABC, uh, authors would be producing documentaries, for instance, um, at the behest of the SABC, um, so they're commissioned by the SABC. SABC then becomes the owner of that documentary, but then that documentary is never aired. So it lies in the archives of the SABC for decades. And um, the, the person who made the documentary, who spent time on it, um, never gets that exposure for, for the documentary. So that is, that is the, the type of situation where the tribunal's role will be able to come in. And it is not simply a matter of allowing that to happen. The, the tribunal will listen to both sides and, and consider you know, whether there is fairness. And of course, if the tribunal then indicates that it can be used, there will be a royalty given to the person who commissioned the work. On offences, um, here I just indicated that, that I do agree with the, the Gauteng proposal that we must make very sure that there is in fact um, a knowledge and that we don't limit things that the, 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 the act will provide for. So the proposal here is that two and three should in fact read together. And, and I agree with that proposal and I recommend that as well. Um, again, on, on offences, um, there was also a, a similar um, um, argument in that, that we cannot prohibit something as an offence that the act or the bill somewhere else allows. And that can be solved by uh, adding the words by law, including in section 28. P. Then there were some other proposals for, for offences to be added, and I indicated that in respect of the, the proposal in 4A, it is simply too broad because all of us possess a phone, and, and um, that would make all of us uh, uh, guilty of 4A, so, so the, the, the specifics there are not sufficient. Then some of the proposed offences were already provided for, and I did not recommend that the, the committee include a, an offence for possession simply because this would be a new thing that is added to, to the bill. It will be the first time that possession is made an offence. And there are just so many questions. Uh, how will we enforce it? Um, what, what, what do we want to achieve? You know, are we targeting the person who is forwarded videos on, on their WhatsApp? Is that, is that the person who is targeted? Because that WhatsApp, when you get the video, you download it. So how will we word this? So although I'm not saying that possession should never be an offence, uh, my recommendation would be that this is something that the department will have to look into and make sure that they understand what the, the requirement is, what needs to be, be criminalised and how, how that will be proven and what would be your search and seizure provisions. Because remember, we are now uh, affecting the private uh, homes of, of people. Um, if you want to enter and to seize a, a, a laptop or a hard drive or a phone. So all of those things need to be considered. Um, then there were also some proposals and where I just pointed out that the wording of the bill currently is still correct. And the proposal to include a fine, I indicated that when, we, when we've discussed with the Department of Justice on how to draft legislation, they recommended that a sum of money is not given because it is possible if you have the actual uh, sentence that you can deduce what the amount would be 
because of the fluctuation of the RAND value and, and, and over years. Then there were proposals in respect of technological protection map measures uh, that they were too narrow to achieve its objective. And I agree with that. I'm proposing that um, we, we delete subsection two and um, of course then the consequential amendments in, in subsection three to change to that. I explained on, on about the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act that the, the sections referred to in the bill were um, actually deleted or repealed by the Cyber Crimes Act and that they are now contained in the Cyber Crimes Act. And I then indicated I would not recommend that we refer to the Cyber Crimes Act because this is the type of thing that happens. Other legislation is amended, um, sections may be deleted. And if they then don't also amend our act, then you sit with an outdated uh, section in your act. Cyber Crimes Act will apply whether we include it or not. Um, and it is, uh, in my, my submission is that that is sufficient. Um, then also, Chair, just in respect of uh, unenforceable, or unenforceable contractual terms and the regulations on contracts, um, there were a lot of concerns about this. And I did explain that there is no right to freedom to contract. Um, perhaps I can just say a, bit, a little bit more here because there, there were some, some questions already coming up that I could hear. Um, when we look at, at, at contracts, what, what we need to do is, and, and this is the way our courts are moving as well, is that the whole of a contract must be seen in light of our constitution. So, so the contract itself is not what is protected by the constitution, but what the effect of that contract is. So we, our courts are moving in the direction of um, that, that there must be fairness and, and we're looking at justice for both parties. And that of course is what is being um, proposed by this bill. The, the unfair negotiating positions of authors especially um, needs to be strengthened. And the, the uh, proposal from the department is that the, the act should give uh, parties some requirements of what should be contained in contracts. And here the idea is not to say there must be a 50-50 split or there must be uh, this agreement in respect of ownership. That is not the idea. The idea is, is to make it clear in, ag in agreements that there are certain rights and that those rights must be protected. And I made a proposal that um, we could perhaps rather make it very clear that the minister's right to give contractual terms is in respect of standard terms and that they will be reflecting the rights as set out in this act. So what the minister may do is to prescribe a list of matters that must be covered in contracts. So the, the, the minister would, for instance, prescribe that the contract must set out the equitable remuneration or the royalty that is due to the author when the, the ownership will uh, pass from the author to the copyright owner, to the new copyright owner, uh, things like that. So, so it's more a guidance in respect of what must be contained as standard uh, terms in, in a contract than what those terms must state in respect of the relationship between the parties. And the purpose is simply to protect the vulnerable. So in other words, to give effect to the constitutional rights of the authors um, and by doing so to try and bring some balance. The short title and commencement, um, and Chair, there was already a question on this. So if I can maybe so, uh, answer that question while I'm talking to this, we must keep in mind that clause 40 is currently in a bill. But when we read clause, thought, uh, clause 40, we'll see that it says this act is called the Copyright Amendment Act. Now, that means that clause 40 only becomes um, valid, if I can call it that, or operational once the president has assented to the bill. So clause 40 does not take away or interfere with the rights of the president to uh, perform his duties in respect of the final check and balance when it comes to legislation. So that the president has the right to consider the legislation. Um, may uh, There was, were sufficient amendments to these bills that the president might refer them back again in terms of section 79.1. That has happened before in terms of, uh, in respect of another piece of legislation. 
or the president may refer it to the constitutional court. So that right remains, and, and Clause 40 does not affect that right. But what Clause 40 says is that once the president has assented to the bill, it becomes an act. And then we need to look at its commencement. And that commencement, what is proposed is that we cannot just wait for the department to bring um, the act into operation. There are certain requirements that must be stated. So one option is to say, you don't say a commencement at all in this clause, and you just say, this is the short title of the act. And then upon publication of that act, after the president has assented to it, it comes into operation automatically. But in this bill, there are some clauses that may need some preparation, especially relating to collecting societies and to the tribunal. And so because of that, I would recommend that we have um, some sort of um, provision that that we can say to the president, um, or, or not to the president, but but as as from Parliament's side to say, look, we're giving the executive 24 months to to put those measures into place. If they do so earlier, the president can, by proclamation in the Gazette, uh, determine an earlier operation date. Um, but if uh, the, the 24 months is what they need, then there's no need for a proclamation the act will come into operation automatically. But then we make provisions specifically for uh, the, the provisions that, that relate to the blind SA judgment to come into operation upon the date of publication in the Gazette. So that would be, be the proposal in respect of Clause 40. On the Performance Protection Bill, there weren't that many uh, uh, comments from a legal point of view. Um, and there was a concern about uh, whether we we um, are looking at foreign artists, and I made it clear that the act only applies to uh, performances in the republic. So we're not looking at um, external performances, but of course that would mean that um, a foreign artist who is making a performance in the republic it will apply to that performance. In respect of definitions. Um, I indicated that producer includes a legal personality, so we don't have to make that um, clear. Um, and then I also recommended that we do refer to the Copyright Act instead of the Performance Protection Act because of how closely these two acts are in fact working together. Um, in respect of um, the, the uh, co standard contractual terms, I'm making the same proposal in this bill as I did in copyright, so that we, in other words, make it clear that the reason for the minister to prescribe uh, contractual terms is to protect rights as are set out in these acts. Um, and then, uh, Chair, the, the rest of the slides were just uh, sort of all the proposed amendments from my side, um, word by word. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Advocate uh, Van Amel. Uh, are there any addition uh, from your side, uh, uh, Dr. Masot, DDG? Uh, good morning, Honorable Chair. Good morning to the Honorable Members, to my colleagues from the DTIC. Chair, I, I had, uh, from our side, there were areas that we addressed uh, from a policy point of view that were not in the Advocate's uh, presentation. And I would also like a chance to just flag them so that uh, it assists the, the members with what was discussed from the DTIC side. And what one will do, will, will ju just to make sure that it's quite a brief uh, scanning of the issues. So if okay. Chair allows me, I would like to just flag them because there were areas where we, we, we prioritize more on the policy side as well, just to clarify um, the, the issues. So okay. I will try to, uh, to to flag that presentation chair and the, um, just to bring up the 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 the, the, the issues. So uh, just uh, chair to just give me a second while I'm doing that. Um, sorry about the the busy screen. Uh, let me try to ensure that I put the slides. Um, okay, there you go. Uh, chair, is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay, let me, let me quickly just do this.
Okay. Yeah. Let me just run through from the beginning. So from, from the DTIC side, uh, we were responding to the mandates um, as the advocate has done. And uh, our focus was just to indicate how the voting uh, was done by the different uh, provinces in terms of the negotiating mandates. Just flag there briefly. I hope you can see in terms of how the provinces so far have looked at the bills. Um, so that's the, that's the, that was the first approach there. And then also just to come to this one, this slide talks to the observations that were made. I think it's important to reiterate this uh, for further clarities, even for the next steps of the processes going forward. So um, we, we noticed certain things uh, when we're reviewing the, the mandates. There were issues that were raised in the mandates by the provinces, um, and they were requesting that were already provided for in the bill. Um, and some provinces raised issues that were government program related and implementation related. And, um, and also other platforms and, and, and organizations. We also saw that there were certain issues that were recurring that I will also talk to briefly. And there were issues that we had addressed in the, in the bills that were recommended. Um, most importantly, there were new amendments that were proposed that given the timing of the parliamentary processes now, uh, they will not be, we will not be able to attend to them because of the implications uh, of they require more time, they require consultations, they may also have unintended consequences. So this is just to highlight that amongst the issues that were brought forward, uh, there's a need maybe for uh, the review amongst the issues on those that may not, not, not necessarily be fitting in these processes, maybe talking to other departments mandates, Maybe also in some respects, we noticed that there were provinces that took the submissions from the public hearings, but without necessarily indicating the mandate, but talking, just bringing all the other platforms where issues were discussed to the process. We just thought it's important to highlight this to assist with the way forward as well. In terms of the slides that were presented, there was a clarification that we provided on the cultural legislation. We have a law called the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act that was passed in 2013. It has not been operational to date and many provinces raised it and stakeholders also in the previous submissions process to say this law is implicating the legislation, however, it's not operational, should it not be deleted? What about the legislation from another department? Uh, we, so this was just to clarify the link between our legislation and that of the other department, uh, the Department of Science and Innovation, which is the protection, development and management of indigenous knowledge, and also to highlight the importance of indige indigenous knowledge in the protection of copyright and also for performance uh, protection. And the, the next one was about the, the, I've already raised this briefly on the observations to say there were many issues or, or some that were dealing with other government's mandates, not necessarily the bills or the work of the department in terms of these bills. So those are important for clarification and going forward for when the processes are being addressed by the, the provinces. A major one was on the lack of the socioeconomic impact assessment. I'm not going to talk about the processes, but just to indicate this was raised by various provinces. It was raised even in the public hearings in parliament on the, in the select committee to indicate that there was a CS uh, that was done for the department by the, DP, by the presidency and to indicate also that there were various copies of the CSS and we started uh, these processes as far back as 2015. And the, the first bill was uh, published before the guidelines were in place uh, by government. And also to indicate that there were various copies of the CSS that were finalized for cabinet processes for introduction to parliament. And to indicate that um, there was a progression and work that was done on the bills through that process of 2015, 16, and also 17. 
So we do have those various uh, certificates confirming the processes. And to also highlight that there is no requirement for government to put them for public publication, because there is an expectation that we had to publish them for the stakeholders, just to clarify that. And in addition to the CSS, we did studies that um, looked at the importance of the exceptions and limitations, fair use, uh, also the Copyright Review Commission that talked to the uh, so collecting society uh, regulation and the music industry. And we also did work on the policy and we looked at the regulatory impact assessment. There were other studies that they date back as far as, as far back as 20, 2009, 2010. And, just to indicate that there was sufficient consultation as far as we are concerned and also much research informed the work of the bills. And in terms of the international treaty alignment, I will not talk much on this, but to indicate that the, there was care taken to ensure alignment with the treaties, especially the WIPO treaties, the digital rights, and ensuring that we don't contradict the, 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 the TRIPS agreement, the Ben Convention, and also alignment to the Marrakesh Treaty, but also taking into account our constitutional obligations. So there was alignment in terms of the treaties. And we also uh, did a lot of work here with our, if from our legal side in the department and also working with the parliamentary legal in terms of this alignment of the treaties. And we, 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 we are also mindful of the fact that we have not yet acceded to some of these treaties. Uh, although we have ensured alignment. So we are not yet members, but we have done that, uh, ensuring that alignment. And we think that they are in alignment with the, uh, the three-step test, with the international obligations. And yes, in some respects, we added more rights in some of the provisions to ensure that we, we provide for our developmental context and our legal context. So coming to the specific provisions, there was a... Um, the definitions that we looked at, the definition of broadcast, there were proposals made by the provinces on the broadcast. Some were concerned with the terminologies that we are using on the broadcast to say that what, in terms of what, what, that, what do some of those mean? Uh, there were those who were concerned about the omission of the scope of what broadcast means in terms of the method of transmissions. And it, uh, the definition looking like the current one in the bill, looking as if we are limiting the scope of the broadcast definition. And um, we also noted other debates around the implications of wire. Of course, it was not in this part, current process, but we noted that. And there were, there were proposals that we retain the current definition in the act. And this is just to say, as a department, we also uh, noted that, and we are agreeing with that recommendation. The definition of dramatic work, we noted it, but we also noted that there might be other, it's a, it's a, it, it, it is a substantive amendment, although there is a definition in the act, and we, we support it. However, we are saying that maybe it should be reviewed further in the next legislative process. There was clarity sought on the meaning of wire or wireless, whether it should be, they should be defined. Our view is that even in the treaties, they are not defined. And there is a way that they are approached commonly. And we think that as, it, as they stand for now, we don't have to define them. In terms of this slide, many concerns were raised about the one size fits all approach on royalties to say that, we did not take into account the different industries, the fact that uh, one remuneration system cannot work across all the sectors. And that was not what that was never the intention. However, we noted that maybe there's a need to bring more clarity into this issue. And so therefore on the basis of that, in terms of the uh, uh, royalty related clauses, uh, section 6A, 7A, 8A, um, we, we recommend that we could look at adding uh, wording equitable remuneration to accommodate the different remuneration methods like your lump sum, the advances and so on that has been raised uh, by the various stakeholders and the provinces as well. And also um, there was an, an issue raised about the art market professional in terms of the implication that the way that is drafted, it does not accommodate various circumstances. 
uh, of things that can happen. For example, where we say uh, the, the, the royalty is dealt with uh, jointly, severally by the seller and the ad market professional. What if the seller is the same person? And we are of the view that, that um, this matters can be dealt with in terms of a contractual arrangement. And we don't think that we should make a special requirement in the legislation. There were, there were issues raised around the, on section 39 uh, on the regulations um, related to the royalty rates. This one sifted it out because of the fact that it came up a bit in terms of ministers' powers to issue regulations, uh, ministers' powers on the uh, uh, rates of, um, of royalties. And of course, some mixed it with the issues of contracts and these are separate issues, but for the purposes of doing what is best for the bills, we, are, we, we, we took that into account and also noting one of the comments that was made that the different royalty rates and uses should not necessarily be incorporated in the, in the, in the, in the bill. Um, rather maybe focus should be on one kind of royalty, type of royalty, which is called the resale royalty right. And we've noted those comments and we think that this issue, um, it should be the rates of royalties in terms of the powers of the minister on the regulation should be, should be, um, should be removed in the bill. I think that is CI in section 39, subsection CI. And 8A, uh, section 8A, the concern with section 8A, um, it's about the link between the Performance uh, Protection Act and the Copyright Act. They are stakeholders or provinces who are of the view that there is an overlap. 8A, issues of audiovisual uh, works should be dealt with in the, in terms of the performance, should be dealt with in the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. We are of the view that it should be retained in the Copyright Act because the two uh, legislation are linked, they are interlinked the way they are structured, and also that by linking them also ensures more protection for performers and with the role of the collecting societies and the copyright tribunal, there will be that uh, consideration for them. And the, one of the examples is around the actors. The actors do not have a collecting society, and it's one of the things or that, that they have raised over time in the parliamentary processes. And we think that this link will also assist with the way forward for them to establish uh, a collecting society. And also when there are issues with the tribunal of disputes, they can also benefit from that process, hence the strengthened uh, rights. On the reporting requirements in section 8A for audiovisual works and section 9A for sound recordings, this issue was raised to say, this is cumbersome. Why should we have this kind of a comprehensive reporting in the legislation? And here is just to clarify from a policy point of view that reporting of, of users, especially for commercial purposes has always been a challenge. Uh, we talk about lock sheets in the music industry. We hear about performers whose works are being shown on television, uh, streaming uh, media without them being uh, recognized, without them receiving royalties. So parliament at the time felt this was very important that this be strengthened and criminalized, meaning that there's a need to take this very seriously. We noted the concerns by various industrial players and the provinces, but this is just to clarify the policy to say, this was one of the matters that were seriously debated in parliament that was given much time in terms of what are the implications. We know many performers and uh, who have not received their royalties to date. Some have passed on. And this was one of those areas that took a bit of time in terms of addressing. So that's why it is there. The one on contractual, uh, the contract, the powers of the minister to determine contracts, um, the advocate spoke to that when she was talking to the freedom to contract. I'm not gonna talk much on it, but also this was a policy issue. It also emanated from the Copyright Review Commission that was that was done by the department. And we, we noted the concerns about the powers of the minister, but we think that for protection and ensuring that we create a balance in the, in the creative industry 
especially on contracting, deal, uh, dealing with issues of unfair contract uh, requirements, the exploitation of authors, the exploitation of performance. We think that there's a need to have this minimum standards that could guide, but not to impose. And it's not for the minister to sit in agreements or dictate how the terms should be. It's just to create that extra protection and an environment for, 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 for this. And uh, I won't talk about the rates of royalties already dealt with. Uh, it was responding to one of the issues raised by the one of the provinces, but just to uh, indicate that these issues were considered and taken into consideration. On the policy of fair use, uh, I won't talk too much about it, but to indicate that we think that this, uh, as much as there has been concerns about fair use and the implication for the South African market for investment, for the economy, we think that fair use is a very, um, it's, a, it's an important uh, exception and that it's going to assist in our developmental context. And not only that, it has been recommended by various studies that we did, even the, in, uh, the, the IP policy area that was done in 2014 talked to that. Our initial bill had a fair use pro uh, provision in it. We thought that it's going to be useful, but also taking into account the balance, understanding that it is not a free for all. It is not a, there to encourage piracy, but it has got measures. It's got, it's got four factors that uh, um, informs the usages. And we also note that with words such as, such as you look at the future proof of this, uh, of this exception, and as a regime, we think that we need to, uh, we, we support that it be retained in the bill. We noted the concerns from the provinces about fair use. They were very extensive to say it should be removed. It's gonna have unintended consequences. Others were saying there was no uh, regulatory, I mean, socioeconomic impact done on it. But we think that a lot of work has been, dealt, has been done on fair use. There was a lot of uh, consultation after it was returned to parliament, it was opened up for further consultation and many were in favor. Of course, others were not, but we as a department, we think that it should be retained in the, in the bill. On the, exception, on the other uh, specific exceptions, the, the way we clarified the exception of education, uh, taking into account the concerns that were raised, we take, we take that into account. And we think that the exception for education should be retained given the context of uh, um, 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 the, 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 to deal with issues of development and also uh, to strengthen the current provisions in the act. On this specific slide, the issues were around the specific comments. For example, one was suggesting that there should be a licensing scheme introduced for the education to balance that clause. And we think that the licensing scheme uh, approach is something that we will study further outside this process uh, in terms of the possible unintended consequences that may actually take away the rights that are already in uh, section 12D for, as an example. Um, there was a suggestion around the parallel importation exception uh, in 12B6 in terms of the wording where we are talking about ownership uh, of assignment. Uh, so we looked at that terminology and proposed that maybe the word ownership should be removed in that. And there were concerns about the um, a provision that talks to the 12B, 1B that talks to the broadcasters, uh, the ephemeral right. And we think that as it is in the in the bill, it should be retained. There were suggestions around shortening the timeframes when these works can be kept. And we, 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 we consulted on it. It was part of the previous parliamentary process around the discussions. And we think that this right should be retained in the, in the current timelines that are there, which is six months. And also on the one about the parallel importation, um, um, there was a concern about the ways applied, especially around the distribution and whether this should not be maybe dealt away with in terms of the, of the, of the bill. And we think that the concerns around it, it, deal, it deals with the, uh, the first right, uh, the first sale doctrine that it, it, it encourages the, the selling of, of products uh, across borders, meaning one can buy a product overseas, sell it in the country. There has been concerns about it that it may affect 
several industries, but we think that especially in the publishing industry, it might bring more uh, competition in the country, especially with the issues around the expensive nature of books and so on. And it also introduces a new um, exhaustion system, which is international vis-a-vis -vis the national one that is currently in the act. We think that for now, this um, um, provision, which is an exception, should be retained in the bill. The policy clarity on Section 12D is on the slide. I won't talk to it. We think that Section 12D dealing with education and, and, and teaching should be retained uh, given our co developmental context. And, so, and the provisions have got measures and standards, for example, fair practice uh, controls of how the exception is applied. And it has been extensively discussed and debated on. This one is about the libraries, uh, archives and museums, just to clarify what 19C4 is about. Uh, it's just to say that this provision, we looked into it. It was one of the ones raised by the president and it is for non-commercial purposes. It is for education. It's about you sitting in a particular, you can go to a library and you are able to view a disc or a audio visual works, a video and you are learn it's for learning purposes and uh, the, the processes have to be um, approved for you to be able to do that. And it's not for commercial purposes. And we think that given where we are in terms of the digital world, uh, we think that authors and, and, and copyright owners are safe in terms of the usage of this, given the kind of context it's being used and um, the nature of the, of the environments that it applies to. And also the fact that it's for non-commercial purposes and there should be permission for, for usage. Some suggestions were made about the private copy levy. It's a system where, uh, for especially it works more in the library system. In the EU, they have this system where copies are made and there's a levy that can be charged on it. It is quite a, an extensive system. And we think that we it requires a separate process. We have noted the concerns about possible abuses and exploitation of works of authors, copyright owners, when it comes to uh, copying, whether it's in the library settings. And we think that um, even though it's an important amendment that is proposed, the timing of it is also a challenge. And we think that it should be dealt with in the next possible amendment process. On the collecting societies, there were uh, proposals made on the collecting societies. And um, this was just to clarify the policy. We do need a regulatory framework for collecting societies. Collecting societies have to be accredited. And this was just to talk about their necessity. Some of the suggestions made around the uh, ways that the local collecting society should contract with the foreign societies. We are of the view that uh, it's already provided for in the legislation and also on the reciprocal relationships between the local and international societies. We are of the view that that is also um, addressed. When we say reciprocal, we are not saying that you have to have a relationship. The collecting society has have to um, measure the, the areas of mutual understanding, check if it's expedient or desirable to, to merge uh, or to work together and then form those agreements. But we think that the governance issues are going to be addressed with the uh, section, uh, chapter 1A of the bill. And some of the issues that have plagued the different, the, the music industry, especially on the, on the regulation of the collecting societies. There was a proposal that um, the way that a collecting society is cancelled um, when there is a challenge and and the, when it's being uh, is put under management uh, by the regulator that there should be a way that it's, it's administered. We think that what is provided for in the bill is more impartial, is more independent, and members should not be too involved in that process. So let's say there's a cancellation or there are challenges with its accreditation. Uh, and it, it might be in the process of being dissolved. We agree that we need skilled people to deal with it, like your business rescue uh, per per personnel, your administration, people who deal with administration or liquidation. But we also think that it should be a process that is independent and um, that, that is also left to the authorities to deal with. So we noted the suggestion of how it should be addressed. Many comments were on the 25 years reversion clause, uh, right, which is a right that uh, when an assignment is made on uh, literary or musical works um, in the in 25 years, 
it can revert back, it, it automatically reverts back to the author, that right. We noted many comments on that, suggestions to remove it, the fact that uh, it will have different implications, unintended consequences. This was informed by the Copyright Review Commission and uh, it was informed uh, by that process and also the consultation processes, but it also talks to a historical context where rights were assigned uh, uh, to the uh, copyright owner and then the author sometimes unaware of their rights and that right was it just went and there was no proper contractual arrangement around it so policy context this is something that was recommended that was dealt with from a study perspective too and it's not unique to South Africa it's there in other countries so it's just to say that um, we think that the reversion clause should be re uh, retained uh, in the in the in the bill, there were there was a comment to say why not use a contract, a normal contract, to deal with this. And we think that it should be left as it is, as a reversion right, uh, and not uh, mixed with a normal contractual arrangement. And uh, one comment was saying why not ten years instead of uh, twenty five years. And we think that twenty five years was proven to be sufficient time for investment to be recouped, rec recouped by the owner. And then when it reverts, um, there could be that, uh, you, uh, it can then they would have benefited from it. And of course, there's always scope for further negotiate, renegotiation uh, between parties on the same uh, right. On the commission works, um, the context that we looked at was around the, the usage of an agreement when it comes to commission works in terms of where does the agreement fit and who owns the agreement and in which case does the um, agreement have limited scope. But we think that the uh, proposed amendments as they are for commission works, they will bring more protection for the author. They will bring more certainty in terms of what happens when certain conditions are not met, when the work is not used, when the work is used for other purposes than what it was intended. So what are the implications? Who? What happens in those kind of uh, uh, issues and also in terms of what, what the agreement, how it should come in. So we think that as they are, given the challenges that were there with commission works and uncertainty around this and the author's, uh, uh, the author's um, protections and rights, we think that as it is, it's, it suffices. Often works, many provinces raise the concern that it's cumbersome, it's too extensive, uh, it should be, um, dealt with it must some yeah so there were concerns about is impractical these are the works that cannot be located or um, they cannot be located or the persons who, had, who produced them cannot be identified we think that it is a very important provision in our legislation it's not unique to our context other countries have often works i've seen some um provisions that are extensive and yes, it's, it's also one of the areas that we can always learn from and develop going forward, but we think it's very important, especially in promotion of our, our, our cultural um, heritage and also our creativity in the country, innovation and so on. You need to have this kind of uh, framework because somebody can look for a work that is gonna help them to develop something else that is very critical. Then they are willing to go through that process of paying for it, and having access to that work, and it may make a very big difference, even in the economy. So we think that it's an important, uh, it's an important measure that is in the bill. On the copyright tribunal, there were various uh, proposals around the rules about the powers of the tribunal, who should be in the tribunal, not just judges. So we, and also one concern was whether it addresses the performers or the authors and copyright owners only. The intention is for it to approach, to work for both performers, owners, uh, authors, to ensure that they, where there are disputes, these disputes are dealt with by the Copyright Tribunal, which also talks to why it's important for both of these bills to be linked together, because this is one of the institutional measures that will be used to address the various disputes. The Copyright Review Commission also identified the importance of the tribunal. So that's one of the recommendations, although maybe in terms of the focus, the scope was a bit limited, but they looked at it as one of the tools that are cost effective, that will provide uh, measures for, 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 the, uh, for dispute resolution. And also um, on the issues of the fines, um, the powers to impose fines, we think that the tribunal should be able to impose fines. 
This one, I will just quick, quickly talk to. There were many concerns about the dig digital rights that the bills are not speaking specifically on digital rights, uh, on online infringements, uh, piracy issues. But in terms of how the bill is structured, while we looked at the balance in terms of access, uh, protection, ensuring rights, there were provisions added, like for example, on technological protection measures that will bring some measure of protection on the technological management information. Also, there were digital rights uh, offenses added on 27 sec subsection 5A, where whether certain, uh, if you know when you transfer a certain work for commercial, non-commercial purposes, it constitutes a particular offense. So there was consideration on the digital rights and digital issues in terms of the in terms of the bills. And the penalties were also strengthened to look at this. And there are other laws that also, not necessarily our laws, that talks to issues around infringements, like your counterfeit goods act, like your cyber crimes act. So we think that there is some basis or some kind of framework that already exists legally in terms of these. One of the comments made was around the statutory damages to say there should be statutory damages introduced in the South African framework, legal framework. We noted these comments and they were not raised for the first time by the provinces. They were also raised in other processes. We are of the view that this is something that we need to study in terms of including this in the, in the law where we, we put these uh, uh, measures for dealing with losses and injuries and, and losses, especially of, uh, in this case, it will be of, of copyright works that have been abused or where somebody has infringed and then there's that statutory damage, especially many stakeholders spoke about it in terms of fair use when there's um, uh, abuse of, of the rights in terms of fair use, now there should be these damages. We think that we've noted that, but we think that it requires further consultation, further consideration before it's introduced in our legislation because of the unintended consequences that it might bring. There are civil remedies currently in the Copyright Act in Section 24. Uh, there are areas of damages that are dealt with, maybe not as extensive as the ones that stakeholders have in mind, but we think that there are certain remedies that are existing in the Copyright Act currently to deal with some of these issues. But we think that these matters of the statutory damages should be dealt with in the next processes. Concerns were raised about the social media platforms. I won't talk much to it, just to say that we've noted that, but we think that what the bills provide for if proper contracts are dealt with, if proper arrangements of royalties are addressed, if there are mechanisms in terms of exits and dealing with disputes, we think that there would be a playing field around the social media. But to regulate and have a provision on social media at this stage, we think uh, may not be uh, ideal. And we think that is something that can be considered in the next, in the near future, we'll look into it, we'll study this further. But we think that bills as they are, they can address issues of the social media platforms in terms of how parties relate to each other with contracts and also how to negotiate their royalties and, 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 and also the role that the collecting societies will be playing. And on the co offenses and penalties, um, there were various um, concerns raised about the online infringements, whether we should have civil remedies versus criminal uh, remedies. And we have looked into this. This way, some of the most extensive debates in the previous parliamentary processes. Also in the international context, um, as much as some of these are seen as some used words like draconian, we are of the view that um, for now, we should leave them as they are, especially given that we are also uh, observed internationally in terms of how seriously we take um, um, enforcement uh, on, of IP infringements. And we think that as serious as they are, especially where there are criminal related sanctions, we think that they should, um, they should be uh, retained in the bills. And on the, on the regulations, uh, I've already spoken to the powers of the minister and some of the recommendations made, but I will just repeat the recommendation made about the royalty rates to say that we think that they should be removed and be left to the market and to the parties to decide how they manage those uh, transactions amongst themselves. And that the resale royalty rate is the one that can be, um, that can be retained in the, in, the, in the bill. And also there was a comment that said that um, we need to consider having more days in terms of the public participation when it comes to 
to developing regulations uh, to 60 days. And our response to that is that uh, we should, we sh we, the standard is 30 days. It's a, it, they, these are um, in terms of legislative processes, policy processes, we normally extend depending on the, uh, uh, the, the extent of the issue, the scope of the, 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 the proposed regulations. We will have 45 days. Sometimes we would extend beyond even when we do the bills. So we think that this should not be necessarily regulated in the legislation. Even in different processes, parties would say we need more time, there will be extensions. So there, is, there are flexibilities already existing around this. The unenforceable contracts, these are, this, is a, this is a provision that deals with section 39B, that deals with the contracts that are not in line with the act. This is an additional protection. There was a proposed wording that was made uh, to try to uh, say this should be dealt with via the tribunal. Our proposal is that while we noted it, the tribunal will be an additional uh, uh, hurdle or administrative area for an author or the person who's aggrieved to go into when the contract is unenforceable or when the contract is unfair. So we recommend that it be retained in the in the bill. And um, on the schedules, it's just a, a, a clarification issue in terms of the uh, section 22, subsection 3, where a, a schedule is mentioned. Um, I think it's on the revisionary clause to just say that um, there they might be a confusion about this uh, provision and uh, one does not introduce the other. There are two separate uh, sections in the, in, the, in the act. And just to clarify that there's no error there as far as we are concerned. Some submissions on artificial intelligence, um, the fact that we should incorporate artificial intelligence provision in the, in the bill, copyright amendment bill. We think that we don't know enough about this as much as it's a, it's a developing trend. We are in the digital space, in the digital world. However, we need to look at this a bit closely because we might make amendments now and then they have other unintended consequences or they are overtaken by developments. So we think that for now, while we note the concern, uh, it should not be included. It requires its own process. This amendment, uh, if we put a provision, it would also require consultation. Other suggestions made, I won't go into them. They included in, uh, bringing in the internet service provider provision or provisions that deals with internet services. These are new possible amendments. They require their own processes. They require their own consultations. Um, so we are saying that for now, including the computer software interface specifications, we've noted all of them, but we think that they require further engagements, further consultation, and they may be more suitable for the next amendment processes. And including the issue of the extension of the copyright uh, term from 50 to 70 years. Uh, I think one of the reasons 50 years was chosen in our context was because we wanted to ensure that these processes do not take too long, especially for the for the benefit of the 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 the, 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 the author, and also just to make sure that um, we have this in our own uh, South African context. But we've noted the proposals to have a longer uh, copyright uh, term, and we think that uh, for now this requires a new process. It requires its own consultation. And on the digital rights management, the comment was just to say, um, it looks like we may not have enough. We, we need to strengthen the bill. It's just to repeat that we do have digital uh, provisions that deals with uh, online possible uh, infringements, whether it's from the technological protection measures um, and other related similar provisions that I've already spoken to. So we think that even though it may not be uh, most tightened, but we think something was done around that. And on the TPMs, we managed to we also ensure that we don't over uh, put too many stringent uh, requirements because we tried that in the National Assembly and we were told and experts advised that doing too much of uh, strengthening too much of your uh, technological protection measures has got other unintended cons uh, consequences. For example, it may impede on other freedoms, um, whether from the Consumer Protection Act, competition and, and other security implications. There are other challenges that may come and also access where it's needed might be impeded. So as we think what we have so far, it might suffice as in the bill. On the enforcement by commission, there was a proposal to remove the powers of the commission on enforcement. Um, the way we understood the recommendation, we think that we need a strong regulator to look at the legislation. 
on issues of enforcement. If there are violations in the Companies Act, there are violations in terms of the Copyright Act and the and the even performers. So it's not clear in terms of this proposal, but we think that the role of, of the commission should be upheld. It should be there to play a strong regulatory role. So we 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 are not we are recommending and we, we are of the view that the powers of the commission to be an enforcer of the logis- legislation should be retained in the bill. And in terms of the transitional provisions, um, they're linked to the commencements and so on. But we are also, of the as much as we acknowledge that the bill has been long overdue and it has been debated extensively over time, we also acknowledge there are provisions that may need time uh, to be operationalized. For, in, for example, the collecting societies, the copyright tribunal, the readiness, and maybe and others. But we will not be interfering with existing contracts. The act is pro is, is prospective, is going, is looking forward not backwards, but we noted that there's a need to look into this area in terms of the phasing of certain provisions. And yeah, the commencement date and long title will deal with that issue. Um, I'm not gonna talk to the investment in terms of the role of investment and the copyright amendment bill, uh, but just to say, we think that with these bills, the, 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 the playing field is gonna change. There are going to be differences in terms of how issues are dealt with amongst contracting parties. We also think while there is an expectation of erosion of investment, there could also be an erosion of creativity, innovation, and economic uh, development in our context, and also access to education, access to knowledge and creativity. So there could also be that. Now coming to the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, there's not a lot of issues that were raised in this. Uh, just to highlight on the performer, the way com- uh, comments made in terms of the performer, that we should be clear that it excludes extras. Just to clarify, in terms of the treaties, the, the Beijing Treaty, the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty, they do not include extras. They don't even say excluding extras, meaning there is an understanding that an extra is an incidental performer. They don't perform, they're just they. Uh, they're not part of the main cast. Uh, and I think there's an understanding of that nature in the industry. However, because of how much it has been raised and repeatedly so, we think that it's a provision that can be accommodated. Not necessarily that it is, it's something that must be done, but we have uh, considered it and we think that it can be included, but it won't be in line with maybe the way that the treaties are drafted. But we think that if it's going to uh, create some clarity or assist in some way, we think that we will be, uh, it's something that we recommend it be considered. And I uh, think though these were the main ones, including issues around the international treaties, the CSS, our compliance, and some stakeholders were raising concerns that we there is a clubbing of remuneration rights versus the exclusive rights. And just to clarify that where the performer has to consent to the use of their works or their performance, um, we added digital rights. Uh, There were digital rights, the rights to make available to the public. Uh, So that's not, uh, we don't think uh, there's a clubbing of the remuneration and digital rights, but we just wanted to clarify that. We think that as drafted, um, the issues are addressed uh, 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 suitably. And where we added more rights, for example, I think the WPPT talks about a single remuneration. We have the view that there should be continuous remuneration where the work is having commercial implications. So there were areas where we added uh, for the, from the developmental context. And we think that it's allowed in terms of our legal framework and, and the constitution as well. So overall, uh, Chair, I, I think I took a bit of time, but uh, this was the presentation that was made by the DTIC uh, when it comes to the, uh, to, the, to the bills. And just to indicate some of the issues are like mirroring each other. For example, the reporting, we have the reporting in the copyright and we also have it in the performance in some respect. Also the issues of contracts, they are also in the performance protection amendment bill. So any other new amendments we have not incorporated on the labor issues, 
we are not dealing, that we can't mix labor matters with the issues of performance and copyright. Although we note that there are concerns about remuneration of uh, actors, for example, that there should be benefits uh, for them over and above, uh, like a union, like a labor union of some kind. So we note that, but um, I think we will stop there. Chair, thank you so much for this opportunity, just to clarify where we were coming from in the last, um, in the last process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DDG, uh, Masosha. Uh, we were recapping, uh, honorable members, uh, just to to refresh uh, uh, our minds uh, on the responses to the negotiating mandates uh, of the provinces. I think uh, now uh, I will open the floor uh, to members uh, to ask questions of clarity. Any hands? Honorable Dango, Honorable Moima, Honorable Lont, that order. Chairperson, there's a court case at the moment uh, dealing with the issue of copyright. It's got to do, the, the basis of the, the court case is that uh, papers and copyright issues were stolen from a particular company and it's their copyright it was sold on to a uh, publication house which then published it um, and the court case is for them to return those papers and not to pu publish it any longer how would this bill uh, in fact Im impact on such a court case or how would such a court case impact upon the, the legislation is there a court case here in South Africa? It's in South Africa presently at this particular point in time. Okay. All right. Are you done, Honorable? I'm done, yeah. Thank oh, okay. Honorable uh, Muima? Thank you, Chair. Let me start by uh, appreciating the presentation uh, from the two presenters. Uh, the advocate uh, Van of Merve and also uh, Dr. Masocha. Uh, uh, chair, the, uh, an area, an area uh, of uh, interest to me, uh, particularly from the slide that was given by Dr. Masocha, uh, the uh, eight out of province uh, expressing uh, support in terms of their interim uh, mandate. Uh, 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 one of one of the issues that that she picks up is the is the uh, provinces relying on uh, interest groups and content from stakeholders as part of their mandate. I know that as the co as a committee, uh, 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 we also sent the the uh, a response by the department uh, that they gave to us to the to the provinces. So I don't know whether could that have uh, led to to to. Uh, uh, what we see now in the in the in the in the in, in the report from provinces in the uh, interim mandates from provinces, uh, of course, not overlook not not overlooking the fact that uh, the stakeholders were all over. Uh, and you could clearly see that in certain areas they they had consultants that were attending uh, to all the public hearings in various provinces. But as I suspect we might also have have uh, probably uh, uh, contributed to that, uh, <clears throat> which, 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 which now boils me to the, uh, brings me to the point as to uh, whether there could be any uh, area of concern emanating from, from uh, uh, the, uh, the overt uh, contradiction. We support, but we are raising these issues. I think it will be important just to get a sense from uh, from, 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 from the two presenters on that aspect was the, the support for the bill is unequivocal, but there are issues that 
provinces are raising. Uh, uh, of course, taking into account uh, the the doctors, the doc doctors for life uh, principles in terms of uh, what does public participation and public, I mean, public participation uh, entail. They say this. The second point uh, <clears throat> uh, also uh, relates to. What I, I suspect, I, I, I guess, is concession because uh, uh, there, are certain, there are certain areas uh, where both Dr. Van Merwe and also, I mean, uh, Advocate Van Merwe and Dr. Masoja uh, uh, also agree with the proposal from Gaudi. Uh, the and then in regard to Dr. Masoja, she makes concession, but then she says this uh, will require another uh, series and cycle of engagement. Uh, it will re require a new legislative process. That in itself uh, uh, doesn't that uh, also create a bit of a, 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 a a, 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 an entry, a window of a window of uh, opportunity for litigators to say even the department had made concession to say we agree with this, but we are of the view that it is a different. It will need a, a, a completely a new legislative processes uh, in the in the, in the long term. I think that's, 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 that was, that is what one could get, and then. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but I, I agree, I think, uh, uh, from myself, uh, <clears throat> the manner in which, in which uh, the, uh, Dr. Van Berwe and also um, doc, uh, Dr. Masoja and also uh, Advocate uh, Van Merwe has uh, captured the issues, whether it is uh, the definition of, of, of authorized entry, uh, the view expressed by Hauking and Kwasun Natala, and uh, the response thereof, I think, is is is, is quite is quite uh, understood. Uh, but also the the uh, the on, on the issue of uh, extras, uh, what Houting and Northwest uh, have expressed, uh, and how the and how the and how the the uh, uh, both uh, the presenters responded i think must be appreciated uh, but also key to me is uh, the <clears throat> how the two have responded to the to the eras around uh, royalties uh, raising concerns of one size fits all uh, <clears throat> uh, is is quite is quite appreciate appreciative in terms of uh, how uh, the advocate Father Merve and also Dr. Masoja response to that. Uh, more so the, the, the general express, expression, uh, general exceptions, uh, the view that the Northwest, Northwest uh, raises. Uh, <clears throat> but, but also I think the issues around offenses, the issues around uh, intervention, around uh, uh, the, and the need to comply with the blind SA uh, constitutional court judgment, uh, <clears throat> the view that uh, the amendments uh, could be uh, technical in nature uh, is, is an area to me that uh, that 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 that, uh, that gives me comfort. Uh, whether it is offenses, whether it is uh, the issues around technical technological protection measures, as as I I am of the view that. Uh, the manner in which Advocate Van der Merve and also Dr. Masoja have responded to those issues gives me comfort in terms of uh, the, the degree and extent to which they have uh, responded. Uh, likewise, with uh, when it comes to to the views of the provinces uh, in terms of the performance protection amendment bill, uh, I'm of the view that uh, the the uh, both uh, Advocate Van der Merve and Dr. Masoja have uh, comprehensively responded to the issues. So necessarily it will only be those uh, two issues that I raised here uh, around, around, uh, <clears throat> around uh, what appears to be concessions 
does not open a window of opportunity for litigation to to me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Moimang. Uh, Honorable Lont. Uh, can I also ask uh, uh, provinces if uh, members uh, from the provincial legislature they also have a right to ask their questions for clarities, if 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 they can also raise their hands. May I go ahead? Um, yes, uh, over to you, uh, Honourable Lant. Awesome. So, um, Honourable Khadjis shortly touched on what I said last week, and then I'll find it through, through it. So I, I did say tongue-in-cheek um, that there were so many um, amendments and concerns raised by some provinces that it might as well have been a negative and not a positive on the support for, for the bill. And I also raised on the question around um, Advocate Van Amerwe's involvement with this from the very beginning. Because I did say, if you have, if you want three opinions on something, you ask three different uh, lawyers and uh, then you'll get the three different opinions. And I mean, in being involved with the drafting and getting it through the N and getting it through the NCOP and then all of these valid concerns that are raised then it's natural and it's not negative on the, on the on the individual at all that there will be a defense on something that was drafted and defended and pushed through the entire process. And I mean, it was illustrated in the words that was used right at the start, said the bill was as close to perfect. Um, that was used um, during the presentation. And in fact, it is not as was as close to perfect. There were too many concerns raised by too many stakeholders from the provinces um, that that we can say that. And and Anwukai, this is an important piece of legislation that uh, we need to make sure we cover ourselves. And it's one thing that I firstly want to put to yourself is some of these very serious matters, if we can get an alternative um, legal opinion on this that uh, is not from somebody that's been with the process from the beginning, driving it, pushing it, pushing it, and now defending it again. So that, that's the first to, to you, Honorable Kai. The other thing that I, I want to give a slight um, credit to, but then also raise a concern, because we've sat in this situation before, with the, the gambling bill, where concerns were raised by the provinces, and it went back to the department, and they just ignored all of those concerns and inputs, um, basically sent back the exact same um, piece of legislation, and then it was rejected. Now, it seems that there was uh, um, some learnings from that, but I also wonder if the learnings was just to push something that is problematic through, because there's a willingness, and I think it was page, page nine, that they're willing to change minor um, wording, um, like was said, I think, uh, by including, she said, an entity and uh, on a non-profit basis. And I think further on, there was another a uh, wording that was slightly amended. But quite often they also get said, and I'll, I'll go through the other um, presentation now, that good comments were submitted. And I think the word was says progressive amendments were submitted, but they're not willing to include it. It gets kicked down the, down the road to be included in a future Process, but if there's by the own admission of uh, um, Advocate for the and the department, uh, the doctor that presented, if it is so good, why not include it now? We are busy with the process. You agree that there is that there are submissions that will improve, 
but you're unwilling to include it. And that speaks to the ongoing perception that there's a tin ear for concerns that provinces have raised, concerns for what stakeholders have given, and there's a this push from the department and the legal people to, to strong arm us in getting this through. Um, and it's going to blow back on all of us, Jay, that, that sits on this committee. And I do reiterate them back to that first question that we please get um, an alternative uh, legal opinion to the one we have currently gotten on this because I am worried that the, the advice we are getting, although it might be right and correct for the person interpreting it, um, there might be other views that the committee should consider. Um, I just want to quickly chair, make sure that I don't miss any of my notes through these, these pages. So just beg your indulgence on that. Yeah, so like I said, um, changes that were agreed to again, we've got in, I think it was page 38, was an agreement on the change. Uh, page 39, also um, agreement on a, on a change. There's a... Just on, on um, something on page 40, um, there was a, a comment made on uh, fines also, I think it was a Northern Cape proposal that came in. Fines also need to be stipulated, for an example, a minimum fine of 5,000 or a maximum fine of 1%. And then the argument was used that it should not be linked to a monetary value because we are currently, the RAND is not moving in the right direction. Um, the reasons for that, we, we we might differ around the committee room table, but isn't there then something else um, that can be used? I mean, some might not agree it, but even then say, listen, if we go and on a international market, link it to, for instance, um, the dollar, I'm not saying that, but that's an example. Um, again, there's, there's, I don't want to use it cosmetic changes, but that's almost like it feels like there's there's a willingness to do cosmetic changes, but not substantive changes. On the bottom of four, page forty three, um, it stated it again. One thing that I'm really worried about is on at the bottom of page forty four, um, they said, and I and I just want to try and understand that that. Um, this act is called the Copyright Amendment Act 2017 and comes into operation um, 24 months from the date of publication in the Gazette or an earlier date fixed by the President by proclamation in the Gazette. If the President then does not sign uh, or sign it into law or um, get the proclamation in the Gazette, um, then uh, I want to read this now. It's 24 months after the original publication. It just comes into effect. With that, I, I do not think it is the, the right way of doing it. Then you take away, and I touched on it um, last week before we were um, we had to adjourn. That, that is concerning that you take away that, that power um, for the president to actually say, listen, this is problematic. And, and I'm wondering if this was not brought in because the president referred it back. And it speaks again to the perception that's now being created that to whoever is pushing this wants to remove any obstacles and to put it bluntly, then basically see the presidency as an obstacle as well because he, he referred it back the first time. So you kind of take this out of uh, his or her hands because two years from now, yeah, they might, yeah, two years from now is after an election. So after he's out of his or her hands in that that sense. Then, Che, um, yeah, again, at the bottom of page 51, there's again an insertion, which I, for lack of better wording, 
say that this is now the cosmetic changes and not willing to do the substantive changes. And then there's quite a few from the department where the department acknowledged or even said, listen, from our side, we, we view that the following needs to be brought in. But then suddenly they backtrack after engaging um, with advocate Fana Marwe, um, that again speaks to that this thing is, there's a, there's a concerted push to get this thing through without listening to, to everybody. Um, there was, sorry, the pages from the department was cut off in the printed version, but I think it's one, two, three, four, five, page seven, seven or eight, I think. Um, the doctor indicated that provinces did get um, the, the, the socioeconomic impact assessment. Now, I would like to see... Um, if you can provide that with us, the proof that that was submitted to the provinces, um, details of the reports that were shared with the provinces, because my information is that when that was asked, it wasn't forthcoming at all, so that we can just determine where there's a discrepancy. Because if the department says they have provided it and provinces says they haven't received it, then um, there's obviously a significant problem that we need to need to look at. So that is something that I do think we can ask for. Um, it should be easy if it was sent, um, go back to the sent items, uh, get that proof and just provide it to the committee. Then, um, again, it was, I'm sorry, I'll, later on I started numbering the pages, but again, the department said they noted a concern they supported the change, but then it's basically basically showing a middle finger to the entire process by saying that, no, even though we note the concerns from the stakeholders, we support the change, we are not going to listen to you at all. It is uh, under the definitions of dramatic work. Um, I think there was a comment from Gauteng and the, and the bottom. So they supported it. Um, but then they kind of backtrack after an engagement with uh, the, the the advocate. And I think, and I must just, uh, let me just quickly, yeah. Again, uh, the doc, it was said we shouldn't be rushed. If there's an agreement on amendments that should be made, then then let's make that agreement. Let's not kick it down the line. Um, there's, there's one or two, there's a, yes, I, I do wish we get this documentation that's printed out or corrected. So on page, it's 2018, 16, 17, on page 17 on the presentation that, uh, was made from the department. Again, it is, a, a recommended that the powers should go to the minister. Now that is that's a concern. I mean, we should not really leave that kind of powers. Um, you, legislation should be written for not just for good ministers. It should also be written for for bad ministers. Any legislation, and if you leave something open for interpretation, you leave it open to be manipulated. So, so that is just a concern that I want to flag on that one. Then at the bottom or on page 22, again, it comes back to what I said earlier. Um, there was said that it should be considered during the next round of amendments. Uh, the second bullet point, uh, perhaps be assessed for future amendments. Chair, if there's, if there's problems or if there's good suggestions, we should fix it now. We should not delay it. And in, even in the department's own words, um, they said it more bluntly. There was a few of those. Again, at the bottom of, uh, I think it was page 23, basically says this amendment is important, but let's not do it now. Let's do it at future amendments. And that is a trend that goes throughout um, page 26. Again, it's a good suggestion um, that can add value, but uh, will not do it now. Um, 
there was that in that sense there was a complaint about the time frame to to do the new research uh, and and i'm worried Chet, throughout and this is a trend that you'll pick up throughout there's an acknowledgement of valid inputs there's an acknowledgement of problems with the legislation but then every time it gets sidelined um also in page uh, that's 29, 31, 32. There's another recommendation that uh, is amended. Yeah, that the department said it must be amended. And I do think if there is something, even if it's substantial, we should go ahead and amend it if it will make this purely written draft or purely written legislation better. Page 34. Again, in the department's own response, it says that uh, further assessment must be done before it's being included. But uh, you'll see it's the very top bullet point there. But then before we go ahead, let's do those assessments. Let's find out what the impact is and then include something that we are all comfortable to support. And this is something that I think came from both Pumalanga and KZN. And again, a provincial recommendation is just being pushed to the side. There's at the bottom of page 35, um, yeah, there's, there's, you flag the risk of that as the technology changes, legislation can become redundant and needs constant updating. So here you kind of contradict yourself, where you say on the one hand, you argue against solid changes because um, you want it to be included in future amendments. Um, and then at other times you say, but it must be included. So, so Chair, throughout, and this is what we have argued from, from the very beginning, um, that we should rather correct it. At there you'll see this under this section, artificial intelligence, um, the first slide on artificial intelligence, again, there was sa said, note the positive inputs from the provinces, um, something that we can include now already, but then the department says we need to bring this into a future, a future presentation. Um, you'll find the exact same um, under the first slide of artificial intelligence covering other sections. Again, kicking the can down the road saying, um, must be reviewed in next legislation. While we are busy with legislation now, let's do it properly and do not kick it down, down the line. Um, page or slide 46. Um, and this is something that is, is important. I mean, in the words of the present itself, said we cannot predict the impact on the provinces, but that is exactly the concern that was raised specifically by the Western Cape in the submission, that you, you should be able to, with empirical evidence and backing up, make a, a solid guess or solid prediction on what the impact will be on the provinces and then include that. And here again, the department acknowledges that they cannot make that prediction, but they want to include certain things in the legislation. Um, again, under the definitions, there's another part and the second bullet point from DTIC. They support it, but they do not support it for now. They support it for the next one. And it speaks again to trying to rush something through instead of doing it properly. So throughout these presentations, Chair, um, that is a, a theme that speaks to it. And I'm, I'm, I'm also worried that some of the colleagues are, are speaking from the same hymn sheet my plea is we are we have an opportunity to do something correct let's make sure that you don't do a, a half job that is going to come back and bite us not just now but going forward um, as individual lawmakers but also an entire industry um chef for now that's all from my side Thank you, Honorable uh, Lunt. Um, 
I, I just want to uh, to, to to clarify uh, uh, this issue and perhaps some some legal issues. That uh, firstly, advocate for we when we deal with legislation uh, in all our committees, we will have a legal advisor from the legal unit of parliament. Uh, advocate for is not uh, somebody from external. Uh, she's a legal advisor. Uh, from parliament. Um, she advises uh, the committee. Uh, it, it's up to the committee to accept the, the advice or not. All the committees uh, tomorrow will dealing with the, the legislation again in another committee. There will be a, a legal advisor in that committee. Uh, she will have a particular view uh, legally uh, on the aspect of the uh, the legislation that we're dealing with. Uh, they're not pushing a particular uh, a view, uh, but they are basing uh, their, their advice uh, on legal principles. Uh, it's up to the committee that uh, uh, it, whether it takes that legal advice or not. So <clears throat> we can then blame, even with the National Gambling Bill, it is a normal, even in the constitution, the constitution anticipate that uh, uh, there, there will be time where there are differences between the NA and the NCOP uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the legislation, uh, the mandates that come from the provinces may not be in support of what the NA has supported. So that's why the constitution has uh, the, the provision of a mediation committee. It's because it anticipate that uh, uh, there will be that. So what I want to indicate is that it is us as members who will decide uh, in, in the next two or uh, three days, no, not three days, next three uh, meetings that we will be having, the meeting on the 13th, the meeting on the 20th, the meeting on the 24th. It will be us. It won't be Advocate Fund of Merve. It won't be the, the department uh, that decide. We They, they, they may be putting uh, their proposals in terms of uh, responses, not proposal, responses in terms of uh, the, 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 the presentations by the stakeholders and the presentation by the the, the the provinces but then as from next week we'll be going uh, clause by clause saying we the points that uh, 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 honorable uh, Lund is raising can raise on say your your views with regard to uh, uh, clause one clause two clause three so finally it will be us uh, who decide then on the on on the negotiating mandates. Uh, not the department, not, we may agree with some of the points that are raised by the department and the CSLO. Uh, we may agree with some of the issues that are raised by the provinces. And then the act of that, then there will be a package that goes to the provinces. So finally, people that will take a, 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 a view will be the, the committee as well as the, 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 the provinces. There is nothing wrong when the provinces come back and vote against the come back and say they they are voting against. So even with the national government, we, we don't blame provinces for their views. They, it's their views, and it's accommodated in the legislation. It's accommodated in the in the in the in the constitution that sometimes they will vote against a, a, a bill. Sometimes they vote in support of the bill. So there's nothing wrong. It's not like it's something wrong, so we should be ashamed of uh, the fact that uh, uh, provinces have voted against a bill. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of the legislative process. So we should not view as if, uh, uh, therefore, we were wrong uh, when we send the, our views in terms of the, uh, the negotiating mandates, when now the provinces voted against uh, what we sent to them. It's a process, so there was there was nothing should, we should be ashamed of. It's one of the process. It's something that we must we must expect as members that when we send a product to the 
after the negotiating, we have uh, engaged with the negotiating mandates, and then uh, then province vote against that. The, the, we should not be ashamed, of course, it's part of the process. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I'll, I'll allow uh, uh, Honorable uh, Protestant and then allow uh, uh, Advocate Fanemere and uh, Dr. Masocha and Shamara to, 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 to respond to the uh, concerns and questions. Over to you, uh, Honorable Protestant. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, first of all, I'd just like to welcome the way in which you have conducted these proceedings right from the word go. I believe that you've made sure that we've had uh, multiple engagements, detailed engagements on these two bills. But I just want to support uh, Honorable Lont um, in his comments about um, a legal opinion. And I mean this in no way whatsoever is disrespect to advocate for the murder. But as somebody with also with a bit of a legal background, I do understand, I understand that also Honorable Moyamang has a legal background. Um, I find there, it's very seldom that um, a per, per persons in the legal fraternity would have a problem with somebody else casting their eye over any, any uh, legislation just to see if there's a, a set of fresh eyes can see, can can pick up uh, problems, can pick up something that, that somebody else could have missed. We are, after all, all human, and, and these things can happen. And so I would just support Honorable Lunt's uh, assertion and view that, in fact, it may be a good idea to solicit the inputs from other external uh, legal practitioners who are familiar with this field of law to give us their input. And I believe that would be in line, Chairperson, with your very detailed and very transparent and very wide ranging uh, process of, of bringing in uh, various points of view on these two polls. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Protestant. Uh, Honorable uh, Moimang. And thank you, Chair. Uh, it, it, it was just uh, in relation to. Uh, sorry, Honorable Maman, uh, uh, after you finish, uh, can you uh, take over? Well, uh, no, 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 speak, no, yes. no, no. No problem, Chair. I think uh, it, just in relation to the the the, the, the subtle, the subtle uh, 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 Comment which brought us a suspect on uh, on uh, the the attack on uh, advocate uh, Van Rimmer, uh, this week, uh, <clears throat> which I suspect uh, we need to to probably at some point have just have a discussion because let's 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 deal with the with the subject matter at hand. Uh, and not draw any inferences. I think that is an error that I, that I thought I must raise chair because uh, it, it makes me very uncomfortable as the, as part of the select committee to to sort of uh, cast a special on, uh, on, 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 on on the parliamentary staff uh, because they don't have the right of reply. Uh, uh, because the rules of the house also applies to the rules to uh, go to the committee. Yeah, we know, of course, that uh, the right of recourse is uh, the powers and privileges act uh, <clears throat> that uh, is, is, is area that they produce. So I just felt that let me uh, express that view. Other than that, let's get over to to the advocate to advocate Fanar Merve and uh, Dr. Masocha. <clears throat> Sorry, Honorable Moima. Yes, uh, Honorable Lund. I need to make something clear, and I, I do not want you to put words in my own mouth. I can speak for myself. At no way was there an attack, not from me or Honorable Brato said. So I do not appreciate that you phrase it in such a way, and you should know better as well. What I did ask, and what Honorable Browter said also asked, is that we just get 
another view, another set of eyes on this and have that opinion also served before the select committee. If it's the same, then it's fine. But it's your job as a chair to ensure that we get inputs that will allow us to make the best possible decision. It's not your job as a chair to put words in my mouth and then try to make this something this is not. So both myself and Honorable Broutus was quite clear on that. There was a request put forward, and now it's in your hands to decide whether you are going to completely disregard committee members that have put forward a constructive, workable way of going forward, or whether you're going to consider those inputs and then action that. There's a massive difference between those two approaches that were put forward now between yourself and between myself and Honorable Brother C. Yes. I support the view that you've expressed uh, in this regard, that we're dealing here with the structure. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it does seem that there's an attack on a person who, who had drafted the original legislation, uh, re reviewed the original legislation, and described it as near to perfect. Um, that this could be considered to be such an attack, but I hope it's not. Um, that if we want to consider going elsewhere, uh, that, that's another matter. But at the moment, we're dealing with the substance. Uh, the substance that have come from the provinces, the substance that we are going to send back to provinces, and they are going to come back with a, a response there too. Uh, when they come back with a response there too, I think we can kick, uh, take other considerations into account. But I think to anticipate uh, what the provinces are going to say uh, is a bit uh, challenging. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Dango. Uh... Let's, let's skip over to Advocate Father Merve and also Dr. Masoja. Let's start with the Advocate Father Merve. Thank you, Chairperson. And again, good morning to the members. Um, Chairperson, I'm going to just go through the questions um, and comments as they, um, as they came. So um, I'll start with um, what Mr. Dungo asked about court cases. Um, so what we have in front of us, this bill, once a center to and once operational, made operational, that is only when these bills will be applicable. So in other words, any court that currently sits with um, copyright or performance protection issues before, before it, that court must consider the act as it reads currently. So what we call that is that the, the bills will apply prospectively. And um, there is an interpretation law that is against a retrospective or retroactive application of legislation because that creates uncertainty in law and that could affect rights of people. In other words, if I can give an example, the 25 years reversion right that we that the bills make provision for. If that starts um, at the moment that the bill becomes the bill is a to and becomes operational. If that applies to current situations, there will be multiple agreements that will be affected um, where parties were not even aware that this was going to be something that they must negotiate for when they entered into the contract. So we cannot apply it um, retrospectively. So when a court looks at a challenge before it now, it will apply the act as it was before it is amended. So once these bills have been assented to and they become an operation, only then any agreement that is then entered into any copyright act uh, that is taken in terms of a work, um, only then do the, the bills uh, apply. So that is how the bills will affect any court cases that are currently underway and how court cases will affect the bill. Well, blind is, is a very good example. So once we have a judgment, we can then look at, at um, how that could affect the bill. Now, normally, and, and I want to just jump ahead a, a little bit in respect of a question asked by Mr. Lond, 
uh, in respect of um, matters where proposals were made for new inclusions in the bill and the fact that uh, recommendations were that those go to a next stage of review. So when blind SA's judgment was given, the court gave Parliament 24 months to, to rectify the, um, the, the, the concern. Keep in mind that the court looked at the Copyright Act as it reads now. And the Copyright Act as it reads now do not provide for persons with a disability. So the bills were already addressing persons with a disability. And that is why when I presented to this committee, I recommended that we give effect to the court's judgment in this bill already, because there's already a section dealing with the matter and it was minor technical changes that had to be made to make sure that we comply exactly with how the court um, wanted the application. And from, from, from the proposed amendments, the committee have, have noticed it's, it's nothing that was um, substantive. It was really just to tweak the wording to make sure that we really comply with what the court's reading was. Now, if another court's um, judgment came in, and I'm quickly trying to think of something that is not covered in the bill at the moment. Um, and it deals with, um, uh, in fact, one of the examples that, that were proposed, artificial intelligence. And the court is saying, we now have a problem because there was this photo created by, by artificial intelligence and we need to understand who is the owner and there's a gap in the law and we need provision for that. Now, that is not something where I would have recommended to this committee that we give effect to that court's judgment in this bill. Because, and here I'm also speaking, I'm um, in, in, in our office, I'm also with the drafting team. So we deal with legislative drafting, we draft for members and for committees, uh, we develop legislation. So when we look at the development of a policy that informs legislation, that can easily take two to three years. Sometimes in the department, and in fact, I've mentioned this in, in another committee, um, on the, on the Muslim marriages um, bill, where we are now doing a review of the whole marriage act, that policy has taken almost 20 years to develop. Policy development is not always quick. Um, and the only reason I recommended to this committee on blind SA's judgment is that because there was already a policy on the matter in this bill. Um, and that is why I recommended that, that the committee do consider the court's judgment. But otherwise, any other judgment from, from a court, I would be hesitant to recommend that we take that into account um, in this bill. Um, there are many questions that can be raised on new policy matters. For instance, I mentioned the issue of making possession of, um, um, just for, for lack of, of, a, of, a, of a shorter description, pirated work. Um, Possession is something that will need a lot of this and a lot of questions that will have to be asked before we arrive at a policy. There will have to be impact looked at. What is going to be the situation if a, a person is uh, suspected through an IP a technology situation of having downloaded something? So a survey in Pretoria noticed that um, in my house, I downloaded something because of some IP thing that they can figure out. Will the police be able to come into my house? What will be the search and seizure uh, provisions? What if um, the what if my defence comes up and says, "But why am I the only one targeted? Um, what have been done to to target everyone?" There are just so many questions on new policy matters, um, on artificial intelligence specifically. Um, uh, I've read read an article quite recently that South Africa is in fact working on a policy related to artificial intelligence and how that will operate. And I'm sure that something like copyright will be part of that because that is a big question in related to, to artificial intelligence. So uh, my advice would always be to be very cautious when there's new policy being proposed because there's a lot of work that needs to go into new policy so that we don't have unintended con consequences. In these bills specifically, we have seen so many times where a committee acting on inputs from the public made a decision to change one tiny word and then advertised that. And the response that came back was that the impact of that one word being changed is significant. Um, so that we then went back to the previous wording of, of the bill. Um, so, so that is just why I'm saying it's, it, we must be very cautious. So how, how 
a poor judgment will, will impact legislation. It will all depend on the nature of the judgment, if there's new policy or if it is simply a matter of tweaking something. Um, I think also Advocate Ali will speak a bit more about negotiation mandates and that process. And I think the chair also already spoke to that. But I can perhaps just stress again that we are in a negotiation process at the moment. So there is more than enough scope for members to move and to listen to different advice. Um, I am I wasn't present at the, the, the briefings of the provinces, so, so I am not sure what was said to, to provinces specifically. Um, Chair, just in respect of, of advice from our office, from, from the Constitutional Legal Services Office, um, I just want to confirm to the committee that our advice is quality controlled within the office. Um, and as I've said in the first time that I presented to the committee, I'm not expressing a view on policy. I can only provide you on inputs on legislation and um, a parliamentary process and on legislative drafting principles. That is what I have very hard tried to keep my advice to. Um, and I must also just um, remind members, also per my, my first presentation when I presented on the submissions, these bills, I've not been the only legal advisor on this bill, uh, on the on both of these bills. Um, the Office of the State Law Advisor has also advised on the on the bills, especially on the constitutionality of the bills. Um, there has also been some experts that were, have been approached, and from the public, there have been some legal opinions provided. So I've definitely not been the only legal advisor, and my own advice is quality controlled in in our office. Um, the next thing that I just want to speak to, um, oh, that this one is very important. Um, in respect of um, slide 40, where I spoke to um, the, the commencement, I think maybe Mr. Long um, was driving at the time because he's saying he was between two spaces when I explained um, clause 40. So clause, clause 40 deals with the short title and the commencement of the act, the amendment act. We are not at the moment there yet. We are still busy with a bill. Once this bill has been passed by this house, and it, there will definitely, it seems to be maybe amendments passed by the National Assembly again, it will be submitted to the president for assent. At that point in time, it is still a bill. And, and clause 40 is not applicable yet. So the president at that point in time has all the rights that the constitution affords him. And we've even have um, the protection of state information bill was one that was sent back by the president twice in terms of section 79.1 um, based on new amendments. So the president may consider the new amendments to this bill, to both bills, and may on those new amendments may again refer the bills back in terms of section 79.1 the president may also decide to not refer it back to parliament because he's already um, referred it back in terms of section 79.1 and may refer the bill directly to the constitutional court for a decision. So that is the, 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 the one of the, the two rights that the president has. The third right that the president will have is to assent to the bill. So once the president has assented to these bills, then only do they become an act. And once they've become an act, we then have to look at when do they become operational. So what happens is that the constitution requires the president, once he has assented to an act, to publish that act. Now, if we don't say in our legislation, in our bill, we don't say anything about operation, um, it, where it becomes operational by, uh, in, uh, by, um, by proclamation in the Gazette. If we don't have that sentence, when the president publishes that act, it immediately comes into operation. That is, um, as per the Constitution, Interpretation Act also confirms that. So what we are saying here is once the president has exhausted his function, so in other words, he's considered whether to either refer it back in terms of 79.1 or to refer it to the Constitutional Court or to assent, and he's decided that he will assent, then we need to look at operationality. So we're not uh, interfering with the, with the function of the president at all. Operationality is something that we do put into legislation where there is something that needs measures put in place. So in these bills, specifically the copyright amendment bill, there will have to be provisions made for the collecting societies, um, their registration and so on. 
and there will also have to be provision for the tribunal and the new functions of the tribunal. Um, it might be that that can just slot in, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So I would definitely not suggest that the bill comes into, once assented to, that the Act comes into, Amendment Act come into operation immediately uh, because of those, those concerns, that there are things that need to be sorted out in practice first. And in fact, the Interpretation Act also provides that where something has been assented to, so it is in an Act, but it's not yet operational, the minister can actually, if there's regulations that can be made and so on, the minister can perform those acts, even though the act is not yet operational, because they are focused on bringing the act into operation. So the proposal that I was making is that once the president has assented to it and published the act, that the clauses dealing with blind SA matters, that those come into operation immediately. So that is the proposed wording in respect of the definitions and in, in respect of um, um, Section 19D. And then um, that we, as per the proposal from Gauteng, that once these bills have been assented to, once they've been acts, uh, they've, they've been made acts, they have been published, that there then be a limit in respect of how long Parliament allows the executive to put measures in place for the acts to become operational. So that is not interfering with, with the presidency. It is, in fact, not even interfering with the executive because the legislature has the right to say when legislation will become operational. And by saying that it will be by way of proclamation, it simply affords the executive time to put that, that law into operation. But nothing prohibits parliament from saying that this um, act will come into operation on this or that date. In fact, I also did um, some research and found other acts that said this clause will come into operation two months after the regulations have been published. This act comes into operation on this date. Um, so there are, there are many, many examples in that regard. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure. Um, also, I just want to confirm in respect of um, specifically dramatic work, the definition of dramatic work. Um, I just want to confirm the department will also confirm, I'm sure, that um, I had no objection to dramatic work being amended. What I advised the committee last week was that if dramatic work, the definition for dramatic work is amended, I'm of the view the committee will have to advertise. So that was the, the only concern that I had. Not so much a concern, more highlighting a legislative process. There will be a need for this to be advertised because that is something that has never before been part of the bill when the public was um, consulted. Um, I think, yes, Chair, those are, I think, the questions that were for, um, for from the legal's presentation. So I'll hand over then, um, with your permission, to the department to respond to the other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. Uh, Dr. Masoja. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to speak outside the cameras. Uh, I was kicked out of the meeting earlier. So uh, please uh, forgive me for that. I hope it's OK. Um, I've noted the questions by the honorable members. And I'm going to respond. I think most of them are talking to the contradictions and the fact that we noted some amendments that could be made or some good proposals from provinces. And in many respects, we are saying that we will not be, um, uh, they should be pushed to the next processes or for future amendments. And I think I noted, I chair your comment as well to say that where we are acknowledging that there is a possible amendment or a good um, recommendation, and then we say then we are referring it further. So I will just group them all in that uh, side where we are saying something and then we recommend something else. So I think the advocate did talk to it uh, to, to a large extent, but I will just add, one of the things that we have been seriously criticized about as a department was that we have not thoroughly considered issues. And we were criticized, for example, that where is a fair use impact assessment study, just for fair use? Where is an impact assessment study for um, uh, 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 the powers of the minister on contracts? So 
meaning that the public and the experts and the different stakeholders acknowledge the need to do a thorough assessment of an issue when it's raised. And I agree with the advocate. I have examples. We, um, in, the, in the National Assembly process, because of the fact that the bills were re returned and we needed to look at different uh, approaches and to try to uh, correct some of the deficiencies that were raised by the president. We considered new amendments. I will use an example of the ephemeral rights uh, on the broadcasting and the sound recordings where certain recordings are in the broadcasting um, industry uh, recordings and they're recorded. And there's a procedure of how those recordings are kept and uh, issues around royalties around them and so on. We then uh, adopted the example from Canada of how they have dealt with the, um, the approach. We just took it and we said, this is a very good initiative, good example, let's incorporate it. And we did. And when that happened, uh, I remember even one of the presentations, the minister came to present. That's how serious the process we took it. The minister came and then some of the recommendations were around that. We took the Canadian model in. And then we received comments from the public about we need to know more about this ephemeral right. Um, the context is not similar to the South African situation. The language that is being used in that uh, proposed amendment was not in alignment with our terminologies in our legislation. And the unintended consequences, there were many, then we had to remove it. There was also one of the proposals on the three-step test to say include the three-step test in the law, and we did. And we so we, there was a lot of trial and error that showcased that sometimes just taking a provision or a word or a suggestion without testing it, without assessing it, uh, has got implications. The same applies to broadcast. We brought broadcast in. It was an extensive debate. The wording was worked. Now the public is saying there are so many issues with broadcasting. We know that you have amended it and we are, we, we are trying to align with the international treaties. However, there are other unintended consequences. So bring back it, bring back the act as it was. So on the different areas that were highlighted by the honorable member to say, you are saying this, and on this one, you are saying that. We note that. The reason why we place them as they are on the slides is because if someone is proposing something worth noting, I think that as an official to just try to distort my interpretation to suit what I would like to for consistency is not how one would, uh, I think in terms of how we work, it's better to just be transparent to say, we note this, we acknowledge this rather than saying something contrary to align to the recommendation. That's manipulation. So one tried not to be manipulative, but to be transparent and to acknowledge where good suggestions were made. However, those suggestions, suggestions, they still need to be tested. They need to be researched. The same way we have been criticized for not doing different impact assessment studies. Even to date, we still get that criticism. On the President's reservation. There was an issue about insufficient consultation on fair use. It became a constitutional issue referred back by the president to say that there was not sufficient consultation. We were of the view there was, even in parliament, but it was one of the reservations is about that. So I think for all the areas that were highlighted, in, as part of the comments, as contradictions. We think that we thought about these issues. In some instances, they seem like good uh, suggestions, like the artificial intelligence one, but there is work that needs to be dealt with. And there are many examples we can provide to the members of how the, we put them in, like the technological protection measures, definitions. We added stronger technological protection measures. I remember having a debate with colleagues to say, let's strengthen this. The public is concerned about adequate legal protection for the TPMs to align to the treaties. However, we received a lot of comments and suggestions to say there are unintended consequences. You need more work around them. So it's just to clarify that part to say, we are not trying to just push certain things. As advocate said, some of these issues, they take time. You, you do a study, like the Copyright Review Commission was in 2010 when it started. And then there should be further engagements, further consultations. 
Um, uh, uh, this is just to clarify that part. So for all of them, that is the case. Now coming to the other issue of the um, the CSS that were not made public. In the slides, I we prepared in the department, there is no way where we said we gave the CSS to the uh, to the provinces. What I can say is that there are provinces that requested additional information and we provided what we had. There is a province that requested us to come and present in front of it. It also requested studies and the CS records and we provided what we had. However, in terms of the requirement, I think maybe that's where the reading is on slide seven. What we are saying is that it's a code from the guidelines that says we need to submit to an authority. It can be cabinet, it can be parliament, but there is no obligation to submit to, 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 um, to various stakeholders. So maybe, maybe the, the interpretation being made is that we were supposed to, based on the guidelines, submit to the provinces. But those CSs informed the initial processes in parliament. Where they are requested, we provide them. So in terms of giving a record or proof of emails and so on, I think the context is a bit different. But we can make them available to the, to, the, to the provinces now. But just to clarify where that comment is coming from, it's about the guideline and what it says. And we came to this parliament and we provided those CSs. We gave different versions and copies to this parliament. So that was done in this parliament. So that's just, just to clarify that one. And... We, 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 we can still make even other studies available because we are trying to also be uh, assisting to the process and to support the processes. I would just like to clarify also two slides that we made reference to about the powers of the minister. Um, on slide 17, the focus of slide 17 is talking to the Section 8A, uh, the audiovisual works uh, royalties. In that slide, the focus was just to say that in terms of the link between the copyright and performers, Section 8A should be retained. So it was talking to that, not necessarily the powers of the minister, but the fact that um, some of the provinces were recommending that there shouldn't be that link and um, yeah, that there should be that distinction. So it was just to talk to section 8A as a section. And then on, set, on slide 18, the, 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 the reporting requirements issue on section 8A and uh, 9A is about the cumbersome reporting requirements that have been placed on, um, on those sections for issues of royalties. But then in terms of the powers of the minister, the minister is empowered in the legislation to issue some regulations and in some instances may um, make regulations. There, there is, it's not an anomaly for the minister to have such powers. Regulations are important. Like for instance, now with the various provisions that are going to come into effect, once the law is, is passed, he has to issue regulations to make the law operational. So it's part of his mandate. So in terms of the contractual issues that we raised about the contracts, we understand that uh, the minister, many stakeholders raised the concern about his powers, but even there, where there is market failure, the, pre the, 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 the minister is, can intervene. So that's where government comes in. It intervenes when there's market failure, when there are gaps. And if they're not, he may not issue those regulations, but where there's a need for further clarity, further support, further protection, in alignment with the provisions of the act, he can do so. So I think, most of the issues were about the consistencies and, and so on. And the last one is on investment. I think with the way that the world is so dynamic and the economy is, it is difficult. I, 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 I'm subject to correction. Even the most amazing economists cannot predict everything in the economy. No document can predict a war in Ukraine and, and Russia when it's being developed. You can't predict everything and all eventualities. And I was saying as an argument on that slide that the opposite can happen. I know 
there is an expectation that there's going to be an erosion of investment in South Africa because of these bills. What if the opposite happens? What if there is an enabling environment? What if there's more creativity and more growth and more freedom to express yourself and be innovative? What if we have more Trevor Noahs in South Africa? So the opposite can happen. So to say you can't even predict investment in provinces, I note that comment. However, there are things even the best economies cannot predict, and that's a fact. But I note that comment, but uh, and I think that uh, the, the committee will make a decision, the provinces will make a de decision. We gave the best information we can, and where we could agree with stakeholders and provinces, we do, because um, of the transparency of the process. And on the uh, Mr. Mwemang's point about the, the role of the provinces in terms of working with other groups and information, I think that we took the mandates as they came and information is information, concerns are concerns. So it's part of the process, it's part of the negotiation, it's part of empowering the provisions. So I think that um, this is where the process is. And I hope that we clarified ourselves from my side. And that's on the dramatic work one about advocate um, uh, with what the advocate said and I backtracked. I think it's also, an, uh, we realized, and, and I like the word that was used about learnings. Um, we evolve and you learn. And yes, where you need to correct, you correct. So we support that amendment. I was sitting in the public hearings when the stakeholders raised that concern that their industry is very important and they have a lot to offer and we they are not uh, taken into consideration. I noted it, even in fact, I made some stars next to what they were saying. The thing about that amendment is that it is a new amendment and it may have other implications in the, in the bill. And I think that it requires a proper process on its own in the spirit of ensuring proper consultation and um, ensuring that there is a proper response to it. Not that it's not important or we are just casting it away. Just to close on that one, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, you muted? My humble and sincere apology, uh, members. Uh, let me take this opportunity to express a word of uh, gratitude to the man and the team has responded to, to the issues raised by members. Uh, the, uh, the expectation is that, uh, as indicated, we are in this process of uh, negotiation. Uh, I guess. Uh, there will be uh, a further processing by the by the provinces and give us a final mandate. Uh, I know that the the next meeting, uh, uh, Madia, is it the twenty third? Um, the next meeting, Chair, is on the this next week, um, Tuesday, on the thirteenth of July, Chair, on thirteenth of June, Chair, also at nine o'clock in virtual. Yes, but there there will also be a meeting. Uh, uh in the week of the 23rd uh, um, i think it will be in the meeting it will be during the week of uh, of the constituency uh, but i think that is an update that i got from the from the chair uh, but we will we will come back to to the members uh on on that just to confirm the, the exact date uh, uh maybe just check uh, shamara any that you want to raise in relation to to the uh, quality assurance from the legal services thank you chairperson um just to assure members that in terms of quality control although it has already been dealt with uh, by my colleagues i would just like to use the to concur that indeed any document that is prepared by us officials is definitely quality controlled by several superiors like in the NCOP, you would have a procedural officer, procedural advisor, and then the secretary would normally quality control a document. The same applies to legal services and my learned colleague, um, Advocate Fanda Merva. So I think that um, that issue can be led to rest. My colleague is indeed very competent at what she does. Um, the second point I wanted to raise that in terms of 
the um, getting an external consultant into the committee at this point. Chair, it is the purview of the legislature to legislate. At this point in time, the committee should be considering um, the parameters within which they they're going to negotiate provisions that will fall um, into the bill, that will form part of the bill. The concern here is that if we bring an external consultant in at this point, there's no way of guaranteeing that that consultant will not influence the committee in any way or that that consultant will be totally impartial in the advice that he will give um, to the committee. There's very differing views in terms of the bill, and that is why both these bills are highly controversial. Um, so at this point, Chair, it, it will not be procedurally correct to actually appoint an external consultant. However, we do have the internal capacity as well as the know-how to have this document um, quality controlled. Um, Advocate Adhikari, the senior um, legal advisor, the chief legal advisor, um, could be asked to step in um, should the committee require. And I think their internal processes does require her to quality control before the document comes um, before the committee. Then with regards to um, the, the, the committee process when considering the negotiating mandates, I think yourself as well as Honorable Khai has covered um, that. The committee is restricted in terms of their consideration. They can only consider what is part of the mandate. No amendments can be provided by the committee. It's only what's in the mandates that we can consider. And then indeed, uh, members will vote in terms of their provinces for the relevant uh, amendments. Thank you, Chair. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shamara, for, for that. Uh, I guess, uh, honorable members, like I say, you, you all know, uh, this, is was, this was a continuing uh, meeting uh, in, emanating from the presentation that we received uh, last week. Unfortunately, we did not have enough time uh, to engage and uh, seek clarity in terms of the presentations that were made. I believe that uh, today we have uh, sufficiently uh, covered the, that aspect and, and therefore uh, out, uh, allowed the processes indicated to unfold. Uh, and then, uh, 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 move to the next to the next meeting, um, to the next item, uh, and update on Sorry, the. Chair. Maybe yes. you struggle to see the hands that's raised. Oh yes, yes, Lund. Yeah, you can, you can, you can raise your, your point, Honorable Lund. Yeah, Chair, I do think it's important um, that, and we said this the beginning and we some say it more eloquently than others do at no stage was any aspersions cast on the individuals that gave the opinions i do appreciate the explanations on the quality control however i do want us to not just have one opinion that comes to us there's others ex externals and like um uh, 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 Ms. Ali said now they, they might have their own uh, interest of what they proposed but then I also am not sure what quality control means is quality control just taking the opinion that was written by person X whether that is fine but there's like we acknowledge now as well this is a controversial bill. Um, there, there will be different views. So if there's different views, how is it possible that we only get a single view from, uh, uh, I don't want to use an individual's name now, but, but from that department or from that, that, that unit, there should be other views that we may and must take into consideration before we make up our mind finally. And that is the point that I'm trying to make. So out of that exact same unit, there might even be other views, other eyes that have a different view that can still be quality controlled 
and present it to the committee. And that is the, the, the request that I ask, that I think Honorable Browter said covered as well, um, and that I've put to Honorable Chai, and that I put now to you, uh, who's acting now as chair. Uh, Honorable Lund, I think uh, the the procedure, our ambit of the as, as the committee, has clearly been articulated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the process that was outlined by Advocate Van der Berbe. If you look at the first three slides uh, that uh, she presented, outlining where the process started. Uh, who are the experts that were brought on board? Uh, and uh, the second round of experts that were that, that, that were also included. I'm of the view that uh, where we are now, uh, let's allow the provinces, let's allow the provinces to uh, finalize their mandate and then allow the committee to deliberate and take a position as per uh, provinces in that meeting when it arises. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, from where I come from, uh, uh, this matter uh, must further be entertained. Uh, and I'm not gonna give you a hand, an opportunity now because you have adequately canvassed your point. And, uh, we are not going to, 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 to further deliberate on this matter. Uh, let's allow to, to get a briefing on the, on the uh, update of the trip. Uh, uh, so, no, just for the record, then, Chair, because you're now pulling in Romania here, which is not how we operate in Parliament. You know, you, you know, I just, no. Lund, 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 you, you must not do that to me with the respect that I have for you. With the respect that I have for you, uh, don't go that side. But then acknowledge are, when a hand is raised you're not, because you're, 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 you're going to get this if you're going to ignore you members of the committee that raise their oh. hands. If you're going to ignore it, then you're going to get this, Jay. So allow people that raise their hands to raise their no, point. No, 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 but you have made your point. I've, made, I've taken a decision on that point. We are not going to allow it because we are entertaining. It was We are dealing with the negotiations, the provinces have given us their interim. The department and the uh, legal services have responded. The provinces will come back. For now, that matter is laid to rest. I've taken a decision on that. This is not a dictatorship. So I'm going to ask you a question and I want it on the record there. My question was clear. I'm asking that we can ask the same unit that gave this if they can have out of that unit have a different eyes, different people do quality control, you then without a yeah. respond to that, ignored I, that I, I, you allow see, now you're I, doing exactly the same, Jay. You 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 want to complain when we get upset in the house, um, but then this is the actions from chairpersons that cause that. We raise our hands. We wait to be acknowledged, we're getting ignored, then we raise, we get interrupted. You're doing exactly the same as in Gwenya now. So my question to you is- Leave, leave the house request, chair person. Why are you casting a question on, uh, on the house chair? So my question to you is can you, can you straightforward. Can, can you withdraw that? Why, why do you cast a question on the house chair? Who's not part of this meeting? Well, don't act like her. So what I've asked so you now... You ask a question on the house chair who's not part of this. Is that not disrespectful? So what I've what asked you, Chief... What makes you think that you have the authority to do that? What gives you the there's, authority to do that? There's no the authority. There's, there's, there's video evidence that shows how she is. But my question to you, I ask if we might get from the same unit a different opinion. And I just want for the record that you say now, no, we are not going to get an opinion. We will respond on that better in the next meeting. Okay, so I'll ask this in the next meeting, but my question stands, and then you can decide whether you're going to ignore a request from a committee member or adhere to that request. Thank you, Jay. That matter will be addressed in the next meeting, Honorable Lund, and you must treat us with respect. 
you have no authority to disrespect us. Thank you. Honorable members, can we, I, 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 know, that, I know that this matter is, uh, is, is, is uh, reached another point and I suspect we, let's, let's not open it up. My humble uh, appeal, Honorable Dango. Chairperson, that you've humbly appealed, I will listen to the guidance that you've given at this particular point in time on this matter. Just to say that the Secretary of Parliament did indicate that they would take undertake that process already uh, without having uh, be, uh, without having the committee request that. Uh, Chairperson, can we move on to the next point? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Dango. Can we allow a briefing from uh, Sis Grace on the update? Mario? Okay, Sis Grace, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chaperson, and good morning to everyone. With regard to the preparations of the International Study Tour, uh, the, uh, the political application has been approved. But this morning, we were, this morning we were supposed to submit the financial application, but we received a letter, we received an email from UK okay. to say that they are having challenges to secure yeah. meetings with respective departments and stakeholders. Uh, so just, this just, is just hold on, just hold on, just Grace, I see Honorable Tango's hand is still up. Honorable Dango? I suspect it's a legacy hand. Uh, yeah, you can continue. Oh, okay. This morning, around about eight o'clock, we received a, an email from UK indicating that they are having challenges to secure meetings with, res with the respective departments and stakeholders. And these, these visits also coincide with the British summer holidays. So they, they requested members, the committee to come up with an alternative date. So Thank I, you. Uh, I thought this, I must, uh, I must report it to members before we continue with the financial approvals. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Grace. I take that uh, that applies to the UK trip, but not the German leg of it. Yeah, not the German, not the German leg. It's only uh, the UK. Uh, the UK one. Yes. yes. Which which we which, which uh, I believe uh, uh, which which means that. Uh, the study tour remains on track, uh, other than the lack of uh, the lack of, uh, of of UK, which uh, we have uh, noted. Let's 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 for now. I think allow the the process to unfold. Uh, I guess I guess if there if there are any changes, we will be able to communicate that to the members. But for now, the UK leg is off because uh, they are just on the verge of the uh, of the. Uh, Summer, summer, summer holiday. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. With the German, with the German leg, we are busy. We we have already secured the date for members to do the Schengen visa on Monday. Okay. Green point. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, so members. They, yeah, Chairperson, uh, just where, where should we apply for the Schengen visas? The Schengen visas will have to apply online for them. And okay. the TLS company that is doing the Schengen visas in Greenpoint, but we have to go there, all members have to go there at the same time in person. Because those those uh, those forms we cannot submit them online, 
and there is also uh, the, the colleagues will assist members to to fill in those forms. Okay. We'll download the forms and fill them online, and all the colleagues will assist the members on that. Brilliant. Brilliant. And when we when we when we go to to TLS in Greenpoint, there is an amount of five seventy four thirty six that needs to be paid because our our financial approval has not been processed yet. Therefore, we request members to pay out of their pocket and give and give us the receipts. And then we'll, embrace, we'll embed, reinvest them as soon as the financial approval is approved. Thank you um, for that update. Uh, uh, I see Tim and, uh, and, and Sonia sent her up. Uh, I'm glad to say. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, okay, this, this, this thing is becoming a bit messy now. Um, <laughs> Well, f first of all, uh, if we just look at documents, um, we completed the documents relating to travel insurance uh, and we specified certain dates and also the places that we are visiting. Do we have to now redo those documents? And if so, can we please be given the revised dates so that we can make sure that those documents are correct? Or will they be, you know, I remember I sent mine through as a PDF, so I'd have to redo it. And then secondly, is it not possible to go to Germany first and then go to England afterwards? Um, so that we don't have to try and do two trips, or are we gonna truncate this, this visit into one week? Um, we just need to get clarity on all of this here because many of us have other commitments in our provinces because it is during the constituency period. And so, you know, we've put off certain things and now the dates are changing. And I think we just need to get 100% clarity on all of this. But I, I don't know if the English Parliament is back in sitting um, after the 7th of Ju July. And perhaps if they are, if they're not, if they're back from their summer break, then perhaps we can fit the English visit in after the German visit. Um, I'll leave that with you, Chair, but I think we have to read your documents. And then can also that online application, are we going to get guidance on how to do that? And sorry, can the, just the, the amount to be paid just be repeated again, please? I uh, apologize for my signal. I didn't catch that amount properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Bratese. The Honorable Boshoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, with regard to what Grace said, um, the form that was supposed to have been attached, there was nothing attached to the email that I received. So if we can just get Clarity on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Straits. Thank you, Chair. With regard to the online application, the, the, the officials will assist members to go to the filling of the application. The only thing they, they will need to do is to put their signatures on. And the amount of money that we request members to pay is 574 rent. And that money will be reinvested once the financial approval is that's all then. Uh, can you boot? Hello, Dago. I'm Dago. Can you help on the Dago, please? Uh, the, at, at the host. Thank you. Person, yes, uh, yeah. I'm losing uh, co uh, signal here at the moment. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> We just worried because now the uh, you, yeah. you, you no, I've, I've your... listened and I've heard. All right, that's fine. If you can just mute yourself. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, this Grace. Okay, and all members will receive phone calls from from one from the persons who is assisting each member. 
Each member will receive a phone call to say, I'm busy with your application now. I need to fill in this and that and that. So you will be assisted on that application because it's quite a long application. Uh, and yeah. the, we are trying to pass all members in one transport on Monday. The, the, the appointment has been secured for, for nine o'clock. But by the time we get there, the, application, the applications must be filled in because it's going to take long if we don't fill in the applications. Um, what was the other? About the, the holiday, the school holidays in Germany, summer holidays in Germany. I think the whole of, I, I don't know how long it is, this summer, summer holidays, I can, I can ask them, but I think the this duration of our visit is summertime on, on, on the other side, but I will double check with them. And there was, there was a, there was a, a request that we made with the, with the German embassy, because there was a meeting that was supposed to happen in Bonn, in one of the rural areas. So they gave us an option to have that meeting virtual or we fly to that area. When I spoke to the chairperson this morning, he said, uh, I must report this to the meeting. Maybe we can just fly to that place because we will be cutting a lot of we, we will be because we were trying to save a lot of money we, we, were, we were trying to save money cu cutting costs so we decided to do it virtually but now now that we are no longer going to to UK maybe we can fly while we are there and also the chairperson the chairperson wanted to find out if maybe members would like to request uh, their court to increase the days that we are supposed to spend there. The, maybe we can increase them because we are no longer going to, to UK. He said, I can just report that to the committee. Thank you, thank you, Grace. The members, Honorable uh, Boshoff. Thank you, Chair. I want to say it is the summer holiday, so it is very long. I have a lot of family in France and Germany and Austria, so I know that it is a very long period. And um, seeing that we're not going to the UK anymore, um, and we now do have condemnation, let's then fly to Bonn and meet with them. And um, that's about what I have to say. But if it's involving extra costs, then no. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Pratisa. Uh, Tim? Honorable Lund? Yeah, President, I'm sorry, I've, I've, uh, I've unmuted. Apologies. Um, Obviously, the suggestion that we go to the UK after Germany is is, is not feasible. Um, that, that was the question, is to ascertain whether or not they were back um, in, in July. Um, I don't know if we can first get a response to that. Will they be back in Westminster after the 7th of July? If they're back, then perhaps we can move our, you know, we can swap the two trips around and we would put the England leg at the end of the German leg. Um, so that was the first question. If we could just get an answer on that, because then we could try and still do both trips. Secondly, if we um, if, if that's not possible, then I would I would suggest that we make the, the the trip to Germany we extend it slightly to to make sure that we do proper interactions and we make it a proper study tour and not jam everything into one week. And then finally, from my experience of traveling around Germany is there is a thing called the ICE, 
which is the Intercity Express. Um, they're very good trains. They move very fast and uh, they're very comfortable. They're not like buses. Um, and uh, I think they even have um, first class and business class sections if that's an issue. And they are a very, very efficient way and, effect and, and cost effective way of moving around the German, uh, German uh, around Germany. And so you don't always have to fly everywhere. Um, as I said, there are fast trains, and um, and and it also maybe give us an idea to to have an actual experience on proper functioning trains, which we can bring back and and present to Prasa <laughs> um, as, as, as a possible study exercise. It might be killing two birds with one stone, as it were. Um, but yes, the IC is a very efficient way of getting around Germany, and it's fairly cost effective as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, Honorable Lund? Chair, the one thing that I just want to flag, I mean, not that it's a good habit, but it seems like we, we engage with one another, and sometimes when there's oversights in, within South Africa, we don't really mind sometimes, it seems, to start a little bit late and not be on time. Now, that's one thing that I will hang my head in shame if uh, we have hosts waiting for us because we cannot um, maybe do our planning or there might something happen. So that's the one, one, one plea that I put, that whatever program we put together, just put it in such a way that there is ample time to travel between the different engagements because it is utterly embarrassing arriving late um, for, for meetings and uh, it, it just doesn't create a good impression. So, so that's the one thing that I'm going to ask, that we just give that efficient time and we don't get ourselves in that situation, please. Thanks, Honorable Lund. Honorable Shodi. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning, Honorable Chair. My Chairperson is on the issue of the staff that is going to assist us to fill the form. I just want to check with this grace that it's not possible that maybe this staff can come to parliament in one office so that we can go there and fill the forms instead of phoning us. That is the only thing that I want to request the person. If it's possible, if it's not, it's fine. Thank, thanks, Honorable Mishodi. Ms. Grace? Uh... Thanks, Honorable Mushodi. I think I don't think it's a problem to come to Parliament. We can just decide on which day oh. must we must we meet in Parliament, okay. so that we can assist all members that are there yeah. at the same time. Great. Uh, the the point that uh, Honorable Ratisa raised uh, around the summer holidays in UK. Uh, that I will have to have to speak to Derek. Uh, okay. What's going to happen? But right. with regard to the confirmation to Bonn, I'm still speaking to the to Derek in Germany. Okay. Can, can, and can with you... regard to the extension, we'll have to request them to extend the all right the the okay. the, 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 the trip. Of okay. course, to add more information on the program. Okay, no great. Uh, and, uh, and and I, I also just to report, chair. I think even the insurance forms that you have already filled in, I think they are going to change now. Hence, we are not we are no longer traveling to to UK. Okay, good. Can we then agree that? Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, taking into account what uh, Honorable Lund uh, said and what Tim has said about also the experience uh, on the on that we could get in relation to to Praza, but also taking into account what Honorable Lund has said, it might be important that uh, uh, you do some homework to us. Yes. Uh, to yes. Us some homework uh, so that you are then able to to advise us at the technical level in terms of. Uh, what is doable and what is not, what, and what is not, uh, so that we are then able to take an informed yes, decision. Sure. Thank you, Grace. Honorable uh, Basha. Thank you very Honorable much, Chair. Um, I just think that 
to try and arrange something with the UK now, it would have been lovely, is just too much of a short notice. So I think if we can extend the Germany um, trip, it would be better. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Boshoff. Uh, is, that, is that okay, uh, Grace? Chair, can I also get a proposal of the date and time for, for us to meet in Parliament? Uh, from members because this must be done before before, before Monday before Monday yeah uh, what about uh, uh, can we discuss that on the on the on the on the group uh, okay sure uh, because we, it, today is Tuesday so de facto we only have uh, Wednesday Thursday and Friday uh, so one of those dates, one of those dates uh, can, uh, can can be utilized. Uh, so let's 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 check the availability of the members, and then uh, we, we we stick to that. Honorable Boshoff. Okay, I guess that's that's the, that's the legacy hand. Uh, can we agree that we'll deal with the minutes in the next meet in the next uh, uh, meeting? Honorable uh, members, and then uh, take this opportunity to to express a word of gratitude to all of you for having had an opportunity to make this meeting a success. It's a, it's, it's, it's a it's continuation. We are in a process of negotiations. Uh, the department and the and the legal services have responded to the issues that were raised in the in the. Uh, uh, in the presentation from the depart from the provinces, uh, then uh, the provinces will then finally uh, give us uh, their final mandate, and uh, we will deliberate and then uh, take a decision as provinces on that. But let's allow let's allow let's allow the process of to 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 to, to if there is any clarity in questions that might be needed in terms of process, I think we can even sort out it next week. So let me uh, formally declare the meeting closed. And uh, we wish uh, members a wonderful afternoon and also our staff, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the media that is part uh, of us and also the parliamentary monitoring group uh, and our guests and also special delegates from provinces. Thank you, the meeting is adjourned.